And we're live. All right, go ahead. We, hello, world. Welcome oh, to Strong um, Man's channel, Jay's podcast, and we have a guest here, Chris. Please introduce yourself. Hi. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm Chris. Hey, just to avoid confusion, <laughs> my name's Chris, too. So just call me Strong Man or the God Emperor, either one. I like the God Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I swear to God, I swear to God, I was, I was saying, I'm like, I'm like, after fucking Tesla shares crash and there's a market correction, I'm just gonna wear a crown on here and be like, you, you just crown strongman and I, the kings of bro finance on the on YouTube, man. But we recognize yeah. only Sven Carlin as our emperor. That that'll happen in like 2025, you know. Probably be dead by then. Tesla crash way before that, dude. It's going to run up to ridiculous levels with this next round of stimmies. So I have nothing against Tesla, but I was listening to a podcast a few months back, and the guy, the host of the podcast, went off on how Elon Musk is basically conning the world as a it's a Ponzi scheme. That everything he does I, is a Ponzi scheme. His I don't entire think Sorry, dude. Keep going. Keep going. I'm sorry. I was interrupted. Basically, going. the entire thing is based off of hopes and dreams from investors. Yeah. So I was like, like the oh, give me, give me all your money or give me some money and I'll put that into the company. Meanwhile, he's just growing and growing and growing and the government's giving him millions and billions of dollars for SpaceX. He's like, oh, well, I can take this and put it over here. Look at Cybertruck. You know Everybody what? Everybody give me a dollar. You know, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Earnings per, Tesla's earnings per share are negative 0.98 for the last year. Um, I don't think Tesla's a Ponzi scheme. I just think that Elon Musk is a brilliant hype man and a brilliant dude overall. And I think that all these sure. fanboys don't really understand what they're buying. Like you and the three of us understand that oil is going to be with us for the foreseeable future, or we're going to okay. be having rolling rolling blackouts like they do in California. The it's it, look, I socially, I bet you I'm mo socially more liberal than like 90% of the liberals running around because I just take the conservative viewpoint that if it doesn't affect me it's not my business. And the the yeah, the, I I'm very libertarian socially. Like what adults do is their business. I'm just fiscally conservative and a second amendment supporter and I have to look at it like in California, you failed economically because of disconnected from reality policies. Um, unfortunately, that's why I wanted to have one guy on here is to basically explain to him about the minimum wage, Medicare for all, because he doesn't understand. He, he literally right. said the right. Democrats are better because they're giving him a stimulus check. And I said that you'll pay back through inflation. And he didn't get it. People don't understand that they said the banks literally currency. It doesn't, but they don't. Hold on a second. Are you guys getting that feedback too? Nope. Mm -hmm. This well, that, happens every podcast. <laughs> no worries, dude. This is the only podcast that you do that you do in your bathroom. That's true. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. I thought you were just cold. It actually is cold in this room because, like, this room is right above the garage. So I feel bad for whatever kid I put in here one day because they're going to freeze their little butts off all day and all night. But you know what? Hey, not my problem. Hard, hard, time, hard times create hard people. That's right. I probably don't even give them blankets. You know, it's just like suck it up, Weeky. Yeah. <laughs> just all you do is you leave David Goggins on a loop. <laughs> no sleep. Yeah, they need a blanket. Get away from me. They get away with your inner bitch, dude. Just think that it's warm. I mean, honestly, I, I'm a firm believer that if you, you go through some trials and tribulations when you're young and that pays off for the rest of your life. So the earlier the better. Five, six, seven, whatever. You know? <laughs> that's why no, on a serious note, that's why I think everybody like everybody should get their kid into a martial art. It just it teaches them that, like, look, earn it. 
I'm sorry. You're not yeah. gonna you're not gonna you're work. not gonna tap that guy unless you work. I'm I'm a big fan of high school. Right? Like that sports that is the, used the to be that way do in high school. Sports yeah, used sports to be used that. to be that way, but now like, it's, oh, now, you lost. Hey, you're still a winner. There, good job. Come on, you're a winner. No. I was only in high school fourteen years ago, and back then they still had winners and losers. I don't know if it's changed recently, but yeah, you know, they get you to play t ball, I, I don't play baseball. So yeah, like that's when, how it was. they didn't keep score. It's like, what the fuck's the point of this? Kids keep score. It's been the kids they've, do. They've shown them. Buddy, this kids are keeping score, and mm-hmm. it's a it's a valuable lesson to learn to take losses. You're gonna lose in life. Yeah. You're not going to always get what you want and just saying I'm offended and I should be given it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> like, all right. Like, just, it's not that. Pretty like, sure that was right a job. Rolling Stones. Pretty sure that was a Rolling Stones song. Just yeah. Right. Out there. Dude, it, yeah. Dude, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's like today. To all, the only thing you have to do to be exceptional is to just show up and do what you're supposed to do instead of actually being exceptional. Yeah. Very wise, very uh, thought provoking. <laughs> but just it's, dude, it's even it's even it's even the case sometimes here with stand ups. They get mad at the audience if they don't laugh. And I'm like, then your joke doesn't work. Wednesday night, I had to test out this joke, right? I had to test it out on a different crowd because this bit that I've been doing about wishing that I had video game powers in real life and all the just crazy stuff I would do with it, it worked in front of the comedians because they're comedians and they know me, but it didn't work on civilians. The guy hosting the open mic said, would have been an excellent set if you had just stopped one joke earlier. Damn. <laughs> didn't work man i mean there's no that's that's a great thing about stand-up too for people like it either works you either are funny or you're not yeah who gets right. mad at the crowd though like who's admonishing them for not laughing i had uh, mate the guy that was supposed to come on but he's tw- he's uh, he's a rotsy guy and he's but he's 20 years old so he doesn't think out logically what he's doing so he came over today we do a podcast and then I go, okay, so you're going to go home and join us on uh, Strongman and I's joint podcast. He goes, well, I got to go with my family. And uh, I'm like looking at him and I go, you said you were going to – you need to be reliable when you're a doll. If you're going to say that you're going to be somewhere, you need to be – I'm not mad at him, but it was just poor planning. Right. And then I was like, well, Chris wants to come on. So I was planning on asking you anyways at some point. So mm-hmm. that's when I hit you up. But I was just yeah. looking at him. I'm like, Nate, you're in the military. Now. You're, you're, you're in Razi. You're going to be an officer. You have to be where you say you're going to be yeah. in order to lead. Or else people don't respect. Well, what does he want to do on active duty? He's talking about being a drone pilot. <laughs> yeah, you really have to be on time for that. Yeah, and I told him, I'm like, you're going to see a lot of stuff that you don't want to see if, if you're a drone pilot. Just go infantry, bro. Gonna, see that yeah, you're still going to see, still gonna see a bunch of shit you don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, well, it's dude. That's why when I get mad at people when they start talking about a civil war, and I'm like, eh, I've seen enough of war. Just working on the blood hospital generator where the helicopters were bringing in the wounded and I was standing right next to it. I'm like, that's about as much war as I ever want to see. Yeah. Same way. I, I didn't it's not going to be a civil war. Like <laughs> there's some like 20 Antifa guys versus the militia. Okay. They'll kill each other in about an hour of fighting. And then that's that, that's a civil war. <laughs> Did you think are you dip about that? Are you dead? Hey, no. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 You got back on it. So actually I have this I have this plan, okay? This might sound crazy, but I think it's gonna work. <laughs> so I have a work plan. <laughs> Something like that. So I'm trying to quit drinking for a while. But I need okay. some kind of stimulant, right? So I was like, well, I'll quit drinking 
but I need something, you know? So I'll quit drinking, get through that, and then I'll turn to the dip and then eradicate that. And then I'll be entirely drug free. That, that's, that's the awful part. I mean, if that's what you want to do. I mean, <laughs> if I, I mean, don't make look, sense, it makes sense to me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I mean, if, if I had a kid on the way, I would probably try to mostly give up booze. It's just, what are you going to do, especially when the kid's young? You're going to be hung over in the morning? Oh, dude, that I, I can't do it. I don't, I don't know if you have kids. Uh, I, I, I did see a kid earlier, but like, I can't imagine two. God. So I'm having a kid. Well, and, te- dude. Technically three, if you count the dog, because I'm six foot and he's almost as big as me. So. Great day. He probably sleeps through the night, no. but like I can't imagine having a baby American bulldog screaming at like two in the morning, and then I'm like hung over, like oh, trying to deal with that. Yeah, they don't work with me. I've been there, done that. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to quit drinking finally. <laughs> no, uh, so maybe maybe baby comes around. The best thing to do is is trade off one night, your night, 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 your night. Twitch it back and forth. Oh no, it's a wife. Oh no, I can't wait. <laughs> work, trust me. Here's the here's the reason why. I can't breastfeed. The wife can. Therefore, sure. what am I gonna do? If he's hungry at night, Dude. I can't do anything. Dude, sex is oh, trust sex me, there's ways around that. Gender You'll gender find just, out. You're gonna find out. Gender's just just a societal construct. Just breastfeed that that kid yeah you know what if he starves to death because i can't produce breath breast milk then i guess i just so not just wait you know, open up your refrigerator you and go. do you remember that <laughs> family guy <laughs> do, you, do you remember that family guy where peter tried to breastfeed stewie <laughs> oh Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god, it's horrible. <laughs> oh. Straight lard coming out now. No milk. Yeah. That was so funny. I haven't watched it in years, but it, it would kill me. Yeah, I don't even know where it is. Is it on uh, so Hulu, Hulu or what? Yeah. Like, I can't find it anymore. Yeah. All of them on Hulu. Yeah, South Park's on Hulu, but there's a finite amount of there's a finite amount of subscriptions I'm gonna have. I'm trying to save as much money as possible, and it's like that we the the subscription thing was the promise that we could cut the cord and we wouldn't end up paying a hundred bucks a month for entertainment. And they're right where we're right back to that with oh Amazon Prime. So are you buying Tesla stock with the money you've saved? Yeah, my uh, my my portfolio is now perfectly positioned to make me a trillionaire. It is fifty percent Bitcoin and fifty percent Tesla. I'd say is it Bitcoin too? <laughs> That's all you yeah. got to do. That's all you got to do. I don't a trillionaire. Well, Bill O'Reilly keeps telling me to invest in gold, so I don't know if I should do that either. Mm-mm. There is no better investment than a shiny rock. Okay, that is going to make you unfathomably wealthy. I mean, back in like the 14, 1500s, that's, that was wealth, you know? And 500 years in the future, it's still wealth, apparently. I think mine's Dude. still locked up somewhere. So we're Invest- in New Mexico. Invest in We're in lead. New Mexico. In lead? Well, this is almost as good. So we're in New Mexico helping build homes for the Navajo Indians. Oh, dude, that and must have been awesome. Thinking, actually, it was because we were building modular oh, homes. Oh, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. That must have been awesome. No, it, it really was. Um, like I said, we were building modular homes, and they would take the homes, they would split the homes in half. The homes had to be built super, 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 so they could put it on a trailer, all it across the highway, offload it, and then put the house back together. Yeah. But uh, while we were there, we got to go, you know, tool around, and we went out to the Four Corners, and then went around to the Colorado side, out to the river, and I found this piece of turquoise, like that big. Ooh. Turquoise, yeah. solid rock of turquoise. They're saying, "Oh yeah, you'll find turquoise. You're like, you know, this big." And I went out to the river, and there's this giant rock of turquoise. I was like, "We'll take this home." It's packed in a suitcase, brought it home. Dude, that's awesome. So, 
Yep. But it's dull but, and it's green. If I were to break it apart and put it in a tumbler, it'd be all shiny and bright, like you're talking about. Here, invest in this shiny rock. Gold yeah. is gross until you polish it. You know, maybe you're already yeah. a trillionaire. You don't even know it. I mean, that seems like a pretty big shiny rock. It's a big rock. It's not shiny you, yet. There was a there was a there was a poor farmer in uh, like Africa that found like a three million dollar diamond. Can you imagine just coming up like, dude, I'm balling now. I know I don't ever have to do stupid crap again. Yeah, he probably traded that out yeah. his country's currency and then it probably got inflated away to nothing. <laughs> Yay, I got a new tracker. Yay. Um Yeah, dude. Uh so what are you doing? You're taking your profits on uh uh the Nasdaq. Yeah, so I, I have like eight grand in freaking Nasdaq tech stocks and I was like this is just ridiculous. Like I can't do this anymore. So I just, I'm selling it all. I don't care about the taxes and I'm just going to hold on to it. And you know, if the market crashes, then I'll buy VT. And if not, then I'll just put it in my IRA next year. Just, it's just crazy. What's going on right now. Dude. Okay. It's so disconnected from the actual reality of the earnings. When you saw Sven Carlin, like show that I was like, Jesus, it's when you start to realize when it's like sky high, the vet, the the price, and then the actual earnings of the S and P 500 are way down over here. I'm like, I just didn't. I mean, I knew the Schiller P/E ratio was like 35 or whatever, but I just didn't realize how disconnected from reality it's gotten with all these bro investors flooding the market. It's pure mania, man. Pure mania. I mean, like margin rates are so low, people can like buy on leverage, and that just up the price even more you know it's just it's just it's crazy like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna touch my ira or 401k or whatever but like if i have any taxable crap that i can use for better things in the future i'm selling it all now because it's just it's ridiculous my um um my u.s growth fund is up 50 percent over the year i think that's the one that's going to get sold and go into my ira I'm going to buy something that's way lower priced. Dude, I would sell it Monday, man. It's done. Yeah, I probably should. Probably should. Um, it's just, dude, it, it's like, you know, dude, I was thinking about this the other day. I, mi I might have said it last time. But you know how you know there's a rational exuberance? People get emotional when you tell them Tesla's overvalued. What? That's not true. <laughs> like, like, it, like that one guy I showed you arguing with me. Oh, it must be a Tesla short seller. I'm like, it has a 1600 PE ratio, genius. I mean, and it's negative earnings per share. This isn't rocket science here. That's why I just did a video where I'm going to do where I actually explain investing for noobs and why the, these bro YouTubers are idiots that they keep buying stocks. I, I, I got a hundred stocks. It's like an index fund. I bought an index fund and went to the beach and I didn't have to do any valuations on the stock and I outperformed you. Do what? Yeah, oh. I mean, they're, they're going to find out. Then it's going to be fun. Now, hey, Chris, I have a question for you. If let's, let's, do a, let's do a deal here, all right? You give me $1,600. And then every year I will pay you one dollar back. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Are we getting this one dollar back at interest or just one dollar at a time? One dollar a year. No. <laughs> well, that's literally what people are doing right now with Tesla. That's why I won't that's why I won't as a company for the car, fine. If that's what you would choose to do and you think that's a fantastic deal, great. I am in the I I have spent the last 20 years of my life in the energy department or the in the world of energy, whether it's three megawatt generators hooked up to a experimental plant that makes mufflers, or it's working in the oil and gas industry, running a piece of pipe twenty thousand feet down into the earth 
and sucking out natural gas and preparing it to pull out crude oil. If you choose to go electric, Tesla is your thing, and you believe solely in that product, by all means, me personally, I don't believe in it. I don't like it. I don't want anything to do with it. I think it's just crap. Because Dude, I love it. That car in, you keep plugging that car in. If a thousand people plug a car in to the grid, you're not saving anything. You're costing more fuel to run the power plant that's down the road. How many nuclear power plants are there on the globe? Bro, Tesla solar panel. <laughs> Tesla, okay. I'm going to talk about Tesla solar panels. Those things are great. And they can off feedback their grid. But did you know the state of Florida doesn't allow you to buy back? What they do is a cost share. So in the state of Florida, if you put a solar panel on your home, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's a Tesla bank system or a solar panel. I'll get into why I don't like solar panels here in a little bit. You hook a, you do that. State of Florida, from the way I understand this, is you don't make any money off of your solar. Okay, you have what they do is they go off of an offset. Okay, you use 14 kilowatt hours, you produce this much energy. We're going to charge you this much money. Okay, you're saving money, but those things cost you what fifty thousand dollars to put them on your house. All right, I'm confused. So you produce Dude, wait, hold, on, hold on. Hold on. I just love this that somebody like Chris has worked in this in the energy field for 20 years, power production mm -hmm. mechanic in the Air Force, still in the Air National Guard doing it. Is Reserves. basically it who knows way more about this than I do is basically saying the exact same thing that I've been saying to people about Tesla the whole time is that you don't understand the fundamental technology. Battery technology is not going to advance to the point that it can power our civilization because it's impossible according to the laws of physics. And sure, sure. it's so it's like, keep going, dude. I mean, I, I love it. It's you, basically if anybody's listening, you're getting investment advice from a guy who works in an actual industry telling you oil is here to stay for a, hydrocarbons are here to stay for a long time. The, yeah, they, they, they are. They are. They are. They are. Yeah. I don't know what's causing that. I don't know what's causing that. Here, right. How about this? Right. right. How about this? Actually, this is even better. See this? What is this? It's a mouse, right? Okay. Look, what's yeah. it made out of? What's it made Plastic. out of? Plastic. Plastic. Gold. Oil. What? Petroleum product, what petroleum product do you have to have to make plastic? You have to have oil. Hmm. Can I have natural gas? Well, yeah, well, dude, where do, you get do natural, you know, where do you get oil from? You dig deeper than natural gas, and out comes oil. Oh my God. Everybody's, so, everybody's you see oil prices going forward. Like, do you think there's going to be a huge spike in oil prices, or like, do you have any kind of know how yeah. on that? The only way, the only reason, okay, if you watch right now, I've been noticing the last several weeks, Trump lost the election, whether you think he did or not, but whatever, I'm not going to get into that. That's not my thing. I can't actually talk about that. So if you've noticed like where I live, gas was $1.90 to $2 a gallon. As we've gotten closer to January 20th and now beyond, I have seen gas prices at 255 and 263 a gallon for regular. Why is gas prices going up? There is no oil shortage. There's nothing else going on. This Keystone pipeline that everybody's bitching and raving about, whichever, depending on which sides of the fence you're on. Oh, you're killing so many jobs. No, Slumber J, Shell Oil and Gas, all those other companies that are involved in this pipeline, they have folks that are dedicated. They're just going to move them elsewhere. But those are oil sands or tar sands, whatever you want to call them. That production has nothing to do with oil production that goes into gasoline. That has nothing to do with natural gas production that goes to your home. All these memes about the meter with people shutting the valve off. If you don't like pipelines, then turn the valve off to your natural gas. Your home. It has nothing to do with natural gas. Oil sands have nothing to do with natural gas production. Those oil stands were going to come from Canada, go all the way down, 
through the central the United States, all the way down to Texas, Oklahoma, to go to a petroleum distillery so that they could turn it into gasoline and oil and other scientific research. That stuff is disgusting and gross and doesn't do anything for, for what I've understood. It's if you take a scale of crap that comes out of the earth, this is oil sands. No one can, it's it's a scientific research thing. Can you get gasoline and oil from it? Yeah, you can. Is it clean? No, it's dirty. The state of Pennsylvania has the cleanest oil in the entire world. Everyone talks about Saudi Arabia has got the crude oil, but Texas is next. Actually, Pennsylvania has the cleanest oil in the entire world. And the next thing down the line, we all use it. There's a city in Pennsylvania called Oil City. They produce oil. That's all they do is suck oil out of the earth and make oil. (laughs) They grow apples. around there. You go around, you come through the highway, you literally take a bypass around the town. It's nothing but an oil refinery. That's it. I did That's all this. oil city is it. How do I know this? I had to drive through, I had to go do service generators out there. I had to go do fracking fields out there. Oh. Well, it's like this is this is what I said to somebody where they're like, Well, the, the world's going green. I said EVs aren't green, dude. I'm like the only way they could be they're not green. the only way <laughs> The only way they could be green is if you allowed us to use nuclear. And I explained fourth generation nuclear. It's almost impossible for it to melt down from my bro level science understanding. And that's actually relatively clean energy next to everything else. But you hippies won't let us have it. If we're going to go green, we're going back to horse and buggy with steel wheels. Okay. (laughs) That's, That's the only way to go green. Seriously, because show me a way to make rubber out of a synthetic material that'll last as long as the rubber tire we have today. I have no idea how you would do that. Just, just say it, man. Yeah, yeah no, no, I mean, I Bitcoin into like rubber? Is that, is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, just mine Bitcoin okay. and then we'll. Here's a piece right, so of real rubber. <laughs> Here's Bitcoin. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> well, strong man. Remember when we were talking? I mean, we were getting hammered, and we were talking about how Bitcoin, it, it like it, its purpose is going to be defeated because governments are not going to allow cryptocurrency, and they're going to make you make it trackable. And the, the IRS wants to get paid, so it's like your entire thing. We're going to have cryptocurrency that nobody can track. Governments around the world aren't going to let you do that, buddy. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? I call it crime coin, no. man. That's the main purpose that it's used for is to you know do transactions that aren't supposed to be in the banking system. So it's a little sketchy to me, if I'm being perfectly honest. I mean, but I can see like well, a government backed cryptocurrency being a lot more legit. Until I go to a farmer's market. And they say, and I say, oh, well, what forms of payment do you have? Because I don't have any cash. They'll all say, I take PayPal, Venmo, cash, charge. You know, I can swipe your credit card or I can do a chip or swipe, whatever. Until they start saying Bitcoin, it's not a real thing. It's, it's just, it's like the Tesla thing. It's We're like, dinosaurs. <laughs> We're dying. You guys are dinosaurs. You don't understand the technology. Uh, I acknowledge I'm not the smartest dude in the world, but what I do do is I listen to people that are more knowledgeable than me and I acknowledge when somebody is smarter and more knowledgeable. Peter Schiff's telling you Bitcoin's not currency. I'd listen. Yeah. I, <laughs> I have I no objection to Peter Schiff. Okay. I think he's, he's a little, he's hyperbolic, dude, but go ahead. He, go ahead. he sells, he's a gold, he sells gold or he like buys gold mm-hmm. stocks in his funds. So he like, he, he's trying to hype gold, which I also think is a stupid investment. But I mean, he's right about Bitcoin, but at the same time, he's always talking about how gold is so superior. So, like, I like watching him talk and like argue with guys about Bitcoin. And I'm like, you're both stupid. You know, you're both wrong. But I mean, he, he does have a lot well, of. 
He's not necessarily wrong on owning gold mining stocks because, I mean, gold does serve purpose. Like, you have to have it for electronics. Um, and then you, you do. You and do. I, exp yeah. I, exp I explained this to my friend Nate today because, you know, he's a young guy. He's 20. And I'm like, look, I'm like, he's talking about buying more Pepsi stock. And I asked him, but what's the PE ratio? He goes and looks it up. He goes, it's like 26. I go, okay. So just because a company is a good company doesn't mean the price the share is at now is a good buy. Like personally, I think Amazon is overheated. So what, at like 3,200? All the analysts I've read said it should be about 2,500. And I think it's overheated because small business was shut down for the pandemic. But Peter Schiff is right in buying a gold mining stock gold mining stock like Barrett gold is not the worst place to park your money if you're collecting a dividend and it's you get it at a fair price yeah i mean I, buying a gold stock like mm -hmm. i i support buying any stock if there's good fundamentals but i feel like he also kind of encourages people to buy gold itself which yeah I agree with. yeah like, what am I going to do with it? Doing that. It's, a zombie, it's a zombie apocalypse. Gold is heavy. I invested in lead. My lead can be redeemed for your gold. <laughs> I can well, also you can put it on gold. Play with gold. It doesn't have to be gold. <laughs> you know, get a bottle cap and fall out. Yeah. If everyone's got gold rocks and gold bars laying around and Noggle's got lead bars, you broke into an Ace Hardware, stole some gold spray paint, and it did. Throwing lead bricks at you to knock you out to steal your gold. Well, it's about it's about it's that so much bigger. It's, it's about that level because I can't find ammo anywhere. I go to I go to every gun store and they're like, uh, I'm like, hey man, let me get a uh, let me get a box of five five seven. They're like, uh, well, you buying a gun? And I'm like, no, oh, dude, I already got a gun. They're like, well, I can't sell you ammo unless you buy a gun. Like, I'm not God. kidding you. I just did an install three weeks ago on a retired anesthesiologist's house, and. And his garage is where his breaker cabinet is inside of a closet. I open the closet up, ammo cans everywhere. Military style ammo cans with all of his 557, 223, 357, 38, 9mm, 22s, 22 long rifles, 22 Hornets, 9mm, 45s, 44s, you name it. This dude had it all, and they were stacked up four feet high all the way across. Dude, I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm actually this desperate for ammo that one of the gun stores they had a nice little 22 plinker with a wooden stock. I was it was 179 bucks, and I was almost like, yeah, if I if I buy that 22, can I have like 20 boxes of ammo for it? <laughs> like, I mean, like, are you planning to go shooting, or you just want to stockpile more ammo? Like, what what is your ultimate goal? I think it's healthy to have a decent stockpile of ammo. <laughs> I don't think you should be stockpiling for the zombie apocalypse so the ATF breaks down my door in the next ten minutes. No. But it's like, I think you should always have like a decent amount. Like, I'll go this. I think you should always have two hundred and twenty rounds of whatever, uh, two hundred rounds of whatever weapon you have in your house. Whether it be you just feel like going shooting or you feel like you need it for self defense, I'm not that's, one of those guys. Fair. I also think I also think that you know there's a there's a fair bit of wisdom from preppers. You should have food stored in case something happens. A, a pallet of MREs. You never know, man. And like a, a bad storm could cause everything to be down and you can't get out of town. You got a pallet of MREs. You're not going to crap for the entire time you're eating them, but I mean, you got food. No, you will. You, you'll poop. You just won't poop as often. Yeah. Well, that's why you need to have I just live off of them for six months well. again, okay? So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> I live off of them for six months. So just very recently, uh, last year. That's where I got that from. Where were you? Where'd you deploy to? Uh, you can't use that. So you remember, remember hearing about PSAB? No. I didn't hear about it. Okay. So when you and I were stationed together in Ramstein 
And mm-hmm. remember Matasovsky? M- who? Him and I went Matasovsky. Ryan? What the hell is that guy yeah. up to? I want to get him on my pod on this podcast, dude. I would absolutely <laughs> love to hook up one more time just to see what he's been up to and who he's like. Just is he so he's in the he actually came out of the closet? Oh yeah, no, that, he's is he in the reserve? He's in the reserve. I, have, I don't ever talk to him. I haven't talked to him or seen here nor heard nothing from him since I left Ramstein. Couldn't tell you. Dude, I dude, I heard from him when I was stationed in Iraq. And um you do do you know that do you know that he was one me and me and Clemens were the only two that he was actually honest with and told us that he was gay? Well, it's kind of obvious. Kind of. I confronted him one. I'm like, Ryan, you gay? And he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, I got a lot of really good friends. And if they lived like four miles away from me and they were trying to crash at my place every fucking weekend, both nights, I probably headbutt him. And I'm like, yeah. and it's pretty obvious that Phil is gay and he stays over in your room every night. So Phil, through using yeah. my Batman like deductive powers. I deduced that you're probably gay yourself. And he goes, Yeah, I'm gay. Does it bother you? I go, No, I don't care. No. Maybe he just likes to cuddle. No way. Like, doesn't mean he's gay. Huh? Yeah. Maybe he no, likes to cuddle. Um, it doesn't mean he's gay. Well, he no, tried anyway. to pop out on me and say he's bi. I'm like, Dude, you're gay. And he's like, He's gay. No, I'm bi. I'm like, yeah. You're gay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah. But I love that. That's how you did. He's one of my favorite. Let's people what he did to my room. He came. He was. I was. I was in the room, and in the dorms, and I'm passed out, dead asleep. I hear my door open. I'm like, "What the fuck?" Somebody goes into my bathroom, turns the lights on. They're going, taking a piss, and I hear, "Oh shit, I'm in the wrong room." His key. <laughs> it happened to be Ryan, and somehow or another, his key to his room was the exact same key to my room. I bet you all have the same exact keys for the entire building. You know, they probably didn't no. think about hmm, maybe we should have different keys. <laughs> no, of all the, it just so happens it was the pattern of the key. Just somehow or another, his key was just enough of a similar pattern that it opened up my door. Don't know. Dude, They're not. It's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be like sixty million different varieties of key, and somehow his and I is one weird chance. So you're saying there's a chance how- like sixty million houses? I would eventually get into one with my key. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, dude. Remember, remember how Louis yeah, Bryson's. Remember What's how that? Louis Bryson. Remember how Louis Bryson's door would be kicked off the hinges every weekend. Because he would like oh, forget his or something, forever. and he just kicked the door in. God, no! Is this like, <laughs> huh? Is this in a barracks or something? This yeah. is in, yeah, this is yeah. in our barracks. And but like, what would happen to him if he threw it in his door every week? Like, what? It just repair it. Well, he just repair it. He was he like this dude was really handy. Like, he knew how to weld. He knew how to. Really smart dude. He got kicked he was out. Dirt of- boy, wasn't he? Huh? Was he a dirt boy? Was he a dirt boy? I'm not sure. I think he was. Okay, he might have been. But um, did he draft? Was he the guy that had the blue jeep? I think so. Had that great but big really? ass bow saw in the back of it, like this big. No, that was um, that was Melson's boyfriend. Okay, never mind. Never mind. All right. Don't think about but Louis question. Louis wrestled in college and his dad was a boxer. So this dude would fight and he would just beat the crap out of people. And he wasn't even that big. He's like my height and size. And he mm-hmm. I think what finally got him out is he took this dude down that was like six foot four at a party and just beat the ever loving piss out of the guy. You know, there's a, you know how the mili- there used to be a day when the military encouraged people that like to fight to be in it, but that's long past. So they got rid of Louis. Mm-hmm. I haven't talked mm-hmm. to him mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't no, do no, anything. God forbid you do that now. 
It's like waking nope, up in the nope. dorm. There's like, I wake up and like, ah, oh, Saturday or Sunday, I'm hungry. It was whatever it was. I open up the door and there's blood smeared all down the wall, going down the stairs, it's blood everywhere. I'm like, what the fuck happened last night? Go to work on Monday and come to find out, Stadley had gotten in a fight with somebody and it was bl his blood smeared all over the walls. That dude was an idiot. The dude, like, I, I mean, I'd love to see him again today, but that Stadley was an idiot. Dude, he really <laughs> That's what you'd say. He might find you and slap you around a little bit. <laughs> He's going to slap around shit. I remember he was talking to uh, talking shit to Matson one day. I think that's the dude's name, if I remember. He hung out with uh, um, Luke something, and it's been dude. It's been sixteen years, but he talked shit to Matson. Yeah, Matson walked up time. to him, was like, "What did you say to me?" And he goes, "No, I didn't say anything. I wasn't talking to you." And I'm like, "There you were." <laughs> We had a good time. Step up to everybody in the dorms because he was getting punked and it just going down the line and waiting for him. He gets in my face. I'm like, dude, get the fuck out of my face. I don't, I don't know. I don't care about your bullshit. But yeah, he was. Yeah, it, dude, that was. There was dumb shit like that that got us to Woo Saturday where fucking Purtle would come over and bitch at us and have us all in formation in the parking lot. Oh, God. Uh, I'm glad I went over Purtle. to the freaking CTS squadron. Oh, dude, you're smart for doing it. Dude, the CE, well, I mean, honestly, looking back at it, at it I can see why a lot of uh, NCOs get, uh, get fed up with the younger people because, I mean, we were all mostly idiots. Yeah, no, y'all got into a lot of shit after I left, so I'm really glad I left. Yeah. <laughs> we got Stamper knocking people. Remember Bullock? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember when he, he ate that owl long. turd? Wait, remember when he <laughs> ate that owl turd for five bucks because he was getting kicked out? <laughs> whatever. Somebody went, hey, what if I if I put all this Tabasco sauce to spoon with some pepper? You eat it? He goes, yeah. Tabasco <laughs> sauce and pepper. Here you go. Oh, okay, whatever. I was almost throwing up as he was eating that owl turd. I was like watching God. him do it, and I'm like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. How big are owl turds? I don't know. It was like that big. Yes, they're not that big. Like. Okay, yeah, like maybe that's more accurate. But there was like like a partial frog skeleton or something in there. And dude, we're all just looking at him like I was a moron when I was young, but I'm looking at this dude and I'm like, how dumb can you possibly be? Why? What did you do? Oh, you did? How <laughs> are <Lord>, dumb? <laughs> dude. If you're if you're thinking about if you're thinking about joining the military, you should because these are the shenanigans you get into. Oh, oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. The the shit that you will see and do that people don't tell you about. Yeah, just just do it for the shenanigans, Barba. <laughs> yeah, right, right, dude. Like, I'm gonna pistol whip the next person that says shenanigans. Hey, Farva, what's that restaurant? <laughs> that is? Oh. Now, being in the Air Force or the military in general is basically like super troopers. I, I yeah, it's just much. hands down. That's all I think it depends on what branch you're in and who your coworkers are. Because I know there's some some departments in the army, like the S1 shop. I don't think any of that stuff happens. Dude, but they're well, just my yeah, it's 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 definitely like if you go to like the finance department in the air force you're not going to see that but we're ce nope. so we're civil oh, engineers yeah. <laughs> so we're we're basically the half retarded stepchild of the base like to where you know we're lumped in with firefighters plumbers like at the at the dorms at luke DOD. air force base 
Yeah, D O yeah, yeah, EOD at the <laughs> dorms at Luke Air Force Base. My buddy did the naked ninja. He comes running out with his firefighter gear on, so you can't see his head. And he's butt ass naked, and it's like a Friday night at like nine o'clock, and there's people partying by the volleyball pits, and he just comes sprinting through the middle of everybody, butt ass naked. <laughs> There's only That's one other squadron in the all of the Air Force that'll do that. And those are guys that work on a flight line. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's it. It's civil engineering and guys that work on a flight line. That's it. Air, not air crew. Okay. I'm talking about your crew chiefs that don't fly. I'm talking about your age guys. I'm talking about the MSX folks. That's it. Those are the only guys other than civil engineering. And you can look this up. This is the absolute truth for civil engineering. Power Pro guys in general have to have the highest ASVAB score of all of civil engineering. Really? I just found this out. Yeah, I didn't know this. We have to have a higher ASVAB score than goddamn electricians do. Yeah, but I don't think we have to have a higher one than EOD, right? Actually, EOD is lower than us. Is it really? I did not know that. I would, uh-huh. I would think that having to disarm bombs would be the highest, but I mean, you might be kind of dumb if you want to disarm bombs. I don't know. <laughs> there could be an argument. Kind of for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, if somebody went to me, they're like, "Hey, Jay, we need you to go disarm that bomb." I'd be like, "Oh, you got that fifty caliber rifle? Cool. I'll be about five hundred yards away and I'll shoot it." Yeah, but we'll That's give the you a five thousand dollar bonus. Huh? Five thousand dollar bonus if you go disarm bombs. <laughs> oh no! Wait, I'll give you just as high, if not more, to go sit in an air control tower and tell planes where to go. That doesn't stressful. take a very doesn't take a very high ASVAB score for that one either. You got to have in the eighties. Actually, no, I take it back. No, that's a, that's like seventies. I think that's mid sixties or seventies to be an air traffic controller. Also, it's the highest suicide and divorce rate in the entire Air Force. But we, and we I will did give you a twenty-five thousand dollars sign-on bonus to go fly planes from a control tower, dude. If I'm going to become, if I'm going to become an air traffic controller, I'm going CCT. Oh, what? Yeah, I'm not a bi- I'm not a big enough badass to make it through CCT training, but if I sit in a tower. Like, well, I could call in planes in the middle of combat or uh, attack P. Well, attack P's like you're, I don't even know what they do. I I have met guys that do it. I still don't understand what they do. I know that they carry the backpacks. They got the radio and they, they call that shit in and they do it under fire and they fire back. That's, that's all I know. And I know it's, it's tough. I know it's, it's a very tough, job and you're mm-hmm. you're in there with the sf guys you're in there with the rangers you're in there with the seals you're in there with well, yeah tap t- 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 special operations so is so is uh combat control and this is an apocryphal right. rumor this is an apocryphal rumor i could be wrong about this but it was something like i heard that seven cct guys took an airport in the invasion of iraq from like 120 iraqi republican guard and for those people at home, the Iraqi Republican Guard um, were no joke. Was this a Baghdad? <laughs> I it, I don't know. I don't know. It was just somebody relayed that story because to me. I can tell you that's true. Yeah. So that's how bad these dudes are. These dudes are Navy. They're Navy SEALs that do a different job. Although I tend to think SEALs probably are the best. I don't know, but everybody is the best at what they do. You know. So. Like, I was a dude, when I got medic when I got medically boarded. I'll, I'll tell you two stories about the special forces operation, and this is a joke I actually do on stage. When I was mm-hmm. at, when I was in Balad, I was servicing the Caesar generator, and I'm working with my partner, and we're just like talking here. Hey man, uh, you want a you want a sandwich or a soda or something? I look up, it's a captain. I go, oh no, sir, I'm good. And he goes, oh, this is no sir zone. I made eye contact with this dude. And this is how I describe it. And I use it on stage. It was like a domestic dog making eye contact with a wolf. 
that was the difference between me and him. I was like, I in no way am even worthy to be in this man's presence. This dude is so much higher on the male hierarchy than me. I might as well just go in that porta potty and sit down and cry while I pee. Did you like immediately look down and like slump your shoulders in submission? A little bit, a little bit. I baited <laughs> out when I, when I met this Did you your back like a dog. Yeah. Like, rub, rub my stomach. <laughs> but <laughs> when I was getting, when I was getting medically boarded out, this PJ walked past, para rescue walked past me. I just said, "Hey man, how you doing?" Just like with this disturbed, he would give me the business end of his backhand if like I talked to him anymore. But it was like I was like this, just another example of a different level of manhood. <laughs> But yeah, I'm right, sorry. So dude. I, got one. I got one for you. How about this? So the new power plants, all right, for the Air Force for civil engineering is it's all common space. So everything's on a laptop. Okay, so yeah. I've got I'm in we're back at PSAP. That's where I was going with the Matasovsky thing. So we brought a teardown letter to tear down PSAP and move all that shit to buy out Baghdad International Airport. Okay. Well, Baghdad's going away or has gone away. I just went on this last deployment and I just put PSAP back with the Red Horse group that I'm now attached to. I'm I'm actually in that Red Horse group at a Harvard. So here we are Dude, building PSAP back. Yeah, so it's it's awesome. So I'm sitting in a tent. It's me and like two other airmen. Wait, can and, you explain can you explain to the audience? Or, there's no audience, but can you explain to Strongman what red horse is? We have one. So he yeah, well, that is guy needs to know what red <laughs> Is that you? I don't know. It may be me. I don't know. Anyway, you have your cell phone uh, like on, on the live stream? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, uh, so red horse, red horse is, is – it's like – do you know what the CDs are? The CBs? CBs okay. in the so, Navy. They go yeah, in okay, and they so build that. Horse, yeah, that's what Red Horse does. Red Horse comes in and they build everything. They do all the foundational hard work so that civil engineering can come in and actually finish building things or take things over and do all the fine adjustments to everything. All right, so... I come in with, the, I get attached to a red horse group. I come in with them. I help them like legit put the power plant together because they had no idea what the hell they were doing. I got that thing online like three weeks ahead of schedule. I get everything going and it, no one's in there. Like I said, it's me and I've got a couple of air and I'm doing some work on some of the laptops. I'm monitoring everything. So what's going on. And three star general just walks in goes, hi, What's on in here? What are you guys doing? I heard this is like some pretty cool stuff and I want to check it out. It's like, oh, hi. Yeah. So let me give you the spiel of how this all goes down. And it was just, I, yeah, here I am, a regular old tech sergeant. And this three star general just comes in, just shoot the shit, talk about football and my power plant. Did, did he sound and like, first, was he like, hi, guys? No, I was just kind of like throwing that out there. Like, oh, hi, guys. I'm here. <laughs> I don't have my entourage with me. I've got like this other sergeant major of the army with me. Jesus, dude. I'd be I'd be nervous. That dude would have to put me at ease. If we start general walked in. I'd be like, uh, I'd probably be stuttering a little bit. Dude, but they, they like, have, every morning we have a, a, a boarding big big briefing with like all of simple engineering. Hey, this start, this two star or this three stars going to be walking around. Nothing. I didn't know anything about any of this. This dude just shows up out of nowhere. Completely unannounced. That's that kind of weird. He didn't have like his entourage, you know, usually generals overseas yeah. have a whole security. Yes. Detail. I have like fascinated. 10 people with them. I had, all kinds of dignitaries because we're putting peace on the map last summer all kinds of dignitaries just walking into the goddamn power plant hey this is some pretty important stuff you guys are doing here we understand that you talking to me you're the guy that helped put all this stuff together 
why don't you break all this down for us? I have never done so many briefings to so many generals and heads of state in my entire life. All about a fucking program that's on a laptop. And what these big loud machines are doing outside my tent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you probably could have said like complete BS and, and they would have had no idea what you were talking about. I did. <laughs> All right, back. I got another drink. Yeah, yeah, dude. Um, that's uh, well, dude, you're officer class. That, but I mean, you're really an enlisted at heart. But I mean, you had to do. You had to, dude. You had to make those uh, presentations. What's that like? I never had to do it. I wouldn't want to do it either. Are you talking about like making powerpoints and stuff? Yeah, and it's just explaining to people that don't know what, you know, I was at the USF lounge. There was a guy who was a corpsman and, uh, in the Navy, and he basically explained how this politician came out to one of their fobs when he was running with the Marines. He was complaining that he couldn't get ice water, and that's generally how I view politicians and, had, and dignitaries. I generally just view them with disdain because I'm like, you, you don't respect what the guys are doing out here. I'm, I, you know, so I don't know. I, I, I could be wrong, but it's like if I was sitting in there giving a PowerPoint presentation about what I was doing to some politician, as much as that politician doesn't like me, I like him even less. Yeah, but like I, I'm not high ranking. So like the only people I would brief would be like the lieutenant colonel. And, you know, he would know more than me about what was going on usually. So if you messed up, he'd be like, no, what? <laughs> See, I actually had to make sure you knew your crap. But I mean, the highest ranking person I ever briefed was a one-star general. But, I mean, it was pretty simple stuff. Not like Chris was doing with three stars just popping in, catching you off guard. Normally it is. Normally it's the same deal. Normally it's a full bird that just wants to come in and just – you know, they're commander of whatever for the region and they just want to pop in just to see how things are going or they're from overseeing the flight line and they're just getting a tour over this, the compound where everybody's sleeping, you know, and that's usually what it was, but why this dude just showed up out of absolutely nowhere, totally beyond me. Were you, like were you, you said, with the I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to whatever. <laughs> this is what I'll we do. I'll be back in like two All seconds. Right. He comes back like 20 like minutes a, later. Like, I'm feeling a little bit of a clip. I'm going to give you guys a topic. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> My right. buyer's gift for Saturday Night Live. What can we talk about? Water? Oil? Sleep. Yeah, no, let's not talk about water. Water and oil don't mix. Don't do that. That's the that's whole that's the whole concept of fracking, right? Shoot some water down and gets all the oil to come uh, up. Actually, they they do do that, and that was one of the dirtiest. No pun intended. That was literally one of the dirtiest jobs I've ever done. I had a two hundred and fifty kW generator running a compound for whatever machine. And I, I'm not kidding you. The generator was sitting on pallets, on pallets, on pallets. In a berm, there was mud everywhere. You had to have knee boots to walk around the compound because it was so wet. And you, you're – all right, so knee boots, right? I'm in mud up to here. I got knee boots, mud, knee boots. I hope they paid you a lot of money. No. No. <laughs> no. Of course. No. All right, I'm no. going to that. I mean, Bro. comparatively, what I should have been making, no. Where were right, so, we? Uh, I was but wait, I, there's one thing I wanted to say to you. How sick would it have been if it was Mattis that walked in? General Mattis. Well, oh, I what are you doing, Airman? Like, Mattis? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, at, I, US, you, at USF. They, at USF, we created a shrine to Mattis. Huh? Picture of Mattis framed <laughs> with like skull cans and candles. 
And dude, dude what the That's most crazy. shocking thing is this Marine looked at me. He's like, you were an airman. You know about Mattis? Like every member of the military knows who Mattis is and reveres him. Just like Tommy Franks back in the day, man. Everybody knew who Tommy Franks was. Yeah. Everybody knew who that guy was. Everybody knew who Mattis. Chesty Puller was, whether you were Air Force or Air Force or Marine. Every like anybody yeah. that's gonna say they've got they've they're in front of us, they're behind us, they're to the right of us, and they're to the left of us, they can't get away now. Anybody who says that in combat, you're like, ah, I'm gonna follow this guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm behind him. I'm going wherever yeah. he goes, I'm going that way. I'm going. Yeah, I'm going with that guy. I'm going, yeah. But um, wait, where were you in mud? You were in Ohio doing a I was in Ohio. He brought the topic about oil and as he said oil, water. We're gonna talk about it's like, well, oil and water don't mix. He goes, it's like well the point of fracking. Shoot a bunch of oil, put a bunch of water down there, a bunch of oil comes out. And I was like, actually, there was an experimental process. Okay, it was so typically with hydraulic fracturing. Um, they drill and then they case it in concrete. Wait, Chris, and hold on. I'm going to tell you what I think fracking is so you can tell me how wrong I am. Water has right. a higher density than petro than oil. So you pump the water in and it forces the oil up. No. Okay. I stand no. corrected. <laughs> <laughs> me. I don't know how I, no. look, I can't know. No. <laughs> All right, so the way it all works is there are several different processes, but this one in particular was experimental. It's it was actually really neat. Um, there's no oil, there's no base oil, there's no oil, there's no cutting um, additives. There's, uh, there's, there's still a drill bit involved, um, but they use water as a lubricant, right? So okay. they use water as a lubricant to put the drill down into the earth, and it just goes, 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 goes so many thousand feet. And then they go and they make 90 degree this is the fun part. So it drills down, makes a 90 degree turn, and goes across, right? And then typically, what they do, once they make the across, they encase everything in concrete and they have little explosive charges across the um, horizontal. Okay, and then they shoot, they explode it, force the water through or air, and then vacuum all things, literally vacuum everything back out, clean it out. Okay. And there's another case like concrete that goes through and they suck the gas out, cap it. Okay. Well, what this one company was doing, they're experimenting with legit hydraulic fracturing, straight up water, no explosives, no oils, nothing, you know, man-made, everything was completely 100% eco. So they would drill, they would use water as a lubricant, go down, 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 make the turn, down, 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 across, 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 pull the drill bit out and then just force hundreds of thousands of pounds of water just, just boom fracture everything suck all the water out and then gas okay so so that's why there was mud and water everywhere it was just really dirty jesus so that that form of fracking doesn't work no it did work they proved that it worked it's just so, you had to have a massive lake of water to make all of this work. I mean, like a, okay. normally when you go to a frack pond, it's like a, a football field of water, or maybe a half a football field of water, right? You know, and it's like burned out. It'll have a chain link fence around it. It'll say non-potable water, and they'll they'll suck water from that because rain will come in. It'll fill it back up, or snow fill it up, whatever. And they filter it, they dump it back. It's non potable. You can't drink it. It's non, it cannot go to a home. It can't go anywhere. They just use that water to go back to the frack pills. Anyway, and then you're, yeah, that's, that's fracking. So do you think it actually causes all the earthquakes or whatever they're Whatever you and it about. being horrible and things of that nature. Dude, I'm telling you now, I've been in Pennsylvania like half a mile away. From where they're fracking, I needed something to drink. There's a natural spring coming out of the earth. I put a bottle underneath it. I filled it with water from the spring, and I drank it. That was 2012. This is 2021. I'm still alive. We so, can see. Awesome. Yeah. Well, 
I think that, well, personally, I think that, that, you know, mistakes can and do happen, but that documentary, half of these documentaries, they're just sensational, so they get views. Oh, yeah, get me started I mean? on that one. Don't yeah. get me started on that one. But, I mean. All right, so you, you watched it, right? I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it because I was like, this is, just seems like a bunch of sensational BS that I don't want to devote time out of my life to. So it I didn't watch 100%. it. hundred percent is a hundred percent lie. The first one that came out that goes to a Pennsylvania town and they're talking about, Oh, they're fracking here. And look at how much methane's in the water now because of fracking and you can light the water on fire. Yeah. Um, that's naturally, it's been that way. You can go find the guys that are in their nineties and go ask them how long they've been able to light their water on fire. They'll tell you their entire life. Oh, yeah. What what's right. the what's the phenomenon there? That what's the phenomenon with that water? Is it just it's a high methane thing now? Oh, okay. It's methane. All right. It's, it's just an extremely high amount of methane in the water. That's all it is. Yeah, but, but it, it catches more fire now. Okay, the fires have. <laughs> oh, 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 the water is more burning oh. now than it was. But no, it only takes one yeah. match instead of two. See, this oh, it is, just also okay. makes farts more flammable. Okay. Yeah. This is this is the this is the stuff that needs to be told because I'm like, I, you know, I couldn't argue the point on why we need to frack other than energy independence. And then people would hit me with some stuff, and I'm like, uh, I don't know enough about to just counter that. Like I you know what I mean? It's like you start throwing financial BS at me, I can start countering you with all that's stupid for this reason, but like you can't know everything. I don't really what I knew about what I thought I knew about fracking, you just told me was completely wrong, and I'll take your word for it, because you know a lot more about it, and I know you. You know, so it's like the narrative just gets out there and it just gets oh fracking's evil okay but we're not dependent on oil from anywhere else well people have an an agenda they they want to make sure we get rid of oil and they're going to save the world and they'll say whatever they have to say and use whatever propaganda they have to do to make it happen and that happens with like almost every issue you could possibly imagine everything like I, i don't trust any documentary, you know, especially if it has like dramatic music and crying babies. Like I actually go and like try to read this, in, the information and the studies behind it. But, you know, most people aren't going to do that. It's too much work. So, well, that's that right there. That exact premise that you just said is exactly what a guy from Ireland did. They, when there was that um, first fracking documentary that came out in 2011 or 12, whatever it was, when that came out, this guy from Ireland came over and goes, there's a lot about this that doesn't seem right. So he went and backtracked that docu- that that documentary and backtracked everything and did research on everything that he claimed was tr- gospel or truth and found out that all of it was a lie and made a documentary about the lies of everything from that. You, it, but you bring up a legitimate point, all this sensationalist BS – takes away from like real scandals. Like, did you ever on Netflix, there's this documentary called The Devil You Know. And <clears throat> it's about Teflon. Teflon causes birth defects. And the 3M factory okay. in West Virginia was pumping it out. And there was this guy that was, his mother worked around Teflon. So he was born with this weird uh, genetic anomaly. His nose was really messed up. But this was the shocking thing about it. They tried to find people's blood without Teflon in it. They had to go all the way back to blood samples taken from the Korean War. All of us have Teflon in our blood right now. Every single human being on the planet, even the isolated tribes in the Amazon, have Teflon in their blood. And they're worried about fracking. <laughs> like, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, and it's like, but the, the thing is, even on Teflon, look at what it's done for the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? It saved countless people's lives in like a, the technology and clothing enabled it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a trade-off. There's no free lunch. I don't understand why people think there is. 
I mean, at the end there? of the day, it always resorts in just people paying higher prices at the pump, which I think is stupid. That's all it is. And so Teflon is more than just like, okay, so now you brought up uh, was, and it, cooking, it's more than we can like go full circle back to gas and water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where do you use Teflon? Like there's two to three grades of Teflon tape that you use for um so if you're going to do plumbing in your house and you want to, or you have a garage and you want to uh, have an air compressor and do air tools, things like that, you will go to Lowe's or Ace Hardware and buy Teflon tape and you'll tape all of your fittings with Teflon tape. Okay. Teflon. Hello. Uh, yeah. Well, in natural gas, you can't just use regular Teflon tape. Same thing with petroleum products. You can't just get the white Teflon tape. It doesn't work. You got to get the yellow stuff that's petroleum rated, right? I have Teflon paste from Loctite that I use. It's a tube. It's like this big. It costs yeah. twenty three dollars a bottle for a five fluid ounce tube of this stuff. You use it everywhere, every day. It's in everything. Yeah. Well, dude, when we talk about when we talk about getting rid of oil, like we, you know, it, how there's negatives. Imagine a world without plastic. Can't. There would be it, no. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we would also be. This, we would also have. The, this we would also like, have. This thing weighs like a pound. If I didn't have plastic, it would be like, conk. The medical industry. Yeah. yeah. You didn't have plastic. I mean, you know, so it's like. And I, there is something to be said that a lot of, like my personal opinion is, you know, when you're talking about Coke bottles or Pepsi bottles, you could use uh, hemp plastic and that biodegrades in the sun. But the fact remains is you yeah. need petrochemical plastic for certain things because it's going to last. Whereas, you know, Dude. the biodegrade. Dude, the more we so, talk about this, the more I want to go buy the Vanguard Energy ETF. It <laughs> just is like a little play. Because it's been so eaten, beaten down, like and like everybody's expecting oil to go away. So like to me, it's like maybe there's actually big money to be made. Um, maybe there is dude, because why do you think, why do you think I bought those mid? So. Why do you think I bought those midstream stocks as an experiment? Everybody's talking about their energy stock. I'm up fifty percent since June on this, and it's all from just dividends that it's paying me. And another one, I'm up like seventy five percent. Rattler. I was just like, eh, it's a midstream. Let me see what this is going to do. It's part of my fun money anyways. And so I'm up like 70% 70, 70 or 60% on that. And I'm, I'm like, when I saw oil go negative, I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I should be buying energy stocks right now. <laughs> like, oil isn't going anywhere, people. <laughs> no, oil is here to stay forever. Um, it, it's just one of those things. Unless it's you want the great everything you use. Yeah, it's in everything you use, man. I mean, yeah, we're making synthetic oils and synthetic greases and stuff, but you still have to have oils in your day-to-day -day life. You still have to have natural gas. Find me one professional chef out there that's going to tell you, oh, I absolutely love cooking on an electric oven. Right. I call BS. Well, Just dude, saying. You know, you know who I feel bad for is that Greta Thunberg. I've brought this up before. She's just getting used. She is. Is she it cool? Sadly. But I, I would look at her and be like, come on, Greta. We're going to take a little trip. Put my arm around you. See this remote African village that we're at right now? I want you to explain to them why they can't use oil and gas to raise their standard of living while you live in nice, soft, sweet Sweden. Why can't, why don't, why don't these people deserve to live like you do? Are you willing to drop down to their standard of living? No? Okay. Well, then oil's going to be around. We're going to continue to use it. Well, they, the plan they develop is to them at a low standard of living forever. And then, you know, the Western countries eventually transition into anything other than oil. So, I mean, that's probably the old plan. I don't think they well, get to for, Africa or that's whatever. That's where Saudi Arabia is actually going. Saudi Arabia is like the large world's premier oil production, you know, society. 
they, the new crown prince has said, I want to get away from oil and I don't want Saudi Arabia to be affiliated with oil anymore. Yes, we're still going to produce oil, but I don't want that to be the thing that people know Saudi Arabia for. Well, I'm actually worried about the Middle East in general because, I mean, like, obviously some countries, I guess, have other things they grow or produce, but there are some countries that are entirely based on oil. And, you know, if they ever run out or become too expensive to mine, what are all these people going to do? You know? I don't like, know. I, I, Qatar. I was in Qatar all of 2009 as a contractor. Qatar sits on one of the world's largest natural gas pockets. Qatar, that, yeah. that tiny little bitty it, it, little boop. It's that tiny little bitty, that tiny little bitty boop. Yeah, I ex Qatar. I explained, I've explained to like civilians, like you have not, like I've, I've looked at people in Florida when they're complaining it's hot. I'm like, you have not seen hot till you've experienced a Qatari summer. <laughs> I'm like, me and my friend, me and my, me, uh, Martellini were coming back from Iraq in 2008. We had been in Iraq in July. We landed in <laughs> Qatar. We go to sleep. We wake up to go outside. I open up the door and the heat sucks the, the, the air out of my lungs. And I'm like, <laughs> what is this? Because it's 120 degrees in humid at the same time. I didn't think that was possible, but it was like, we literally walked 500 feet to the chow hall. My entire top was wet, like I had gone into a sauna. Now, at what time of day was that, or night? <laughs> All right, how about this? July, 9 o'clock at night, it's 100 degrees and 100% humidity. I walked 500 feet. I, don't, I look like I just walked out of the shower. Yeah, shorts and a t-shirt walk into the laundry room so I can wash my clothes because I was waiting on a rotator to go to Saudi Arabia. I mean, why would you man? You're just going to get drenched all over again the second you walk back to your you know, your barracks or whatever. <laughs> it's all about timing. You have to know when to get a shower and when not to get a shower. It's pretty bad, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I remember dude, when that's... I was there in 2009, we, uh, we hit 150 degrees in August. Oh, my God. God. That's like Jesus. Jesus. Like Jesus. how would we laugh I'm outside? Not, I'm not lying. I'm I'm dead serious. Oh, they really said that the the airport registered it. The main airport in Doha registered 150 degrees. Yeah, dude, I, I've seen that before. I've seen like stats where Qatar was 143 degrees at the airport. Um, mm -hmm. As long as it's probably somewhere in that vicinity, but like the blacktop is probably heating it up slightly. But even if you're looking at 100, I agree. Degrees, yeah, even if we're looking at 140 degrees somewhere else, that's still it's hot. You you have you have. I go in the sauna. The sauna at like uh, Crunch Fitness down here, I think, is like 170 degrees. I'm going in there on purpose to sweat, and it's only like right. 30 degrees warmer than what's over there. How, how long can you last in the sauna at that temperature? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just wondering like, how fast you would die if you were outside in 140 degrees. If I had to do work, I can last five minutes, but I'm sitting in a sauna generally having a conversation. I can go 10 to 15 yeah. minutes, and I go through one of these. This is my limit. When I finished this, I have to walk out because I start to get lightheaded because I have a problem with my – I developed a problem with my thyroid. I don't retain water that well. And you, you if I can. literally had to work, yeah, yeah. And if I had to work, do hard work in 140 degrees, five to 10 minutes, that's all I have in me. We, um, so I was, I ran all the power plant or not the power plant, excuse me, my buddy Mike ran the whole power plant section. Um, during that time, I was in charge of all the mobile generators for all of ID at Air Force Base, right? So all the mobile generators, all the fixed sites, me, this guy was in charge of all of them so I came up with a plan um, we had to get everything done by 9 30 10 o'clock after that we stopped work if you couldn't get it all done by that time work stopped because it was just too hot 
you could not do it. You just, you couldn't keep your water cold. You couldn't keep ice in the cooler. You couldn't do anything. And my night guys had to do all of the work. So what we had to do was go and do as many of the swap outs as we could. If you weren't wearing gloves, you couldn't touch anything. You would get burnt if you touched something with your bare hands. Dude, I was doing, I was, I was doing the, I was doing the, the twelves at Luke and uh, uh, the hook. I left it on top of the tr truck. It was midsummer in Arizona. Went and grabbed it. As soon as I grabbed it, it took like three seconds. It was just searing. I had to drop that. So that's 120 degrees. Well, it wasn't 120. So yeah, about 105. Yeah. 105. So you're even hotter over there. I can't imagine because I remember what it's like to work in the Luke in, in the, the Phoenix, Arizona heat. And it was literally we limited. There were black flag days where we where the Air Force actually had to abide by a black flag in at Luke because you're like, listen, when it's 105, 110 degrees out, you, you're not lasting that long. No, you're not. You you worked in shifts. You you literally worked five on, forty five off. That's that's the black back rotation. Jeez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's five, minutes, five off. Yeah. Five minutes of work, 45 minutes oh. of rest. The reason I was taking hours, I was like, what the hell? Like, why are you taking 45 no. hours off? No. <laughs> five to 10 minutes of work, 45 minutes of rest. That's what you got. Because mm -hmm. you couldn't, you legit could not do any other work because it's just that hot. It's like, why even bother to live there? Like, why, why are humans even settling and living and trying to thrive in something like that? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be a perfect oh, incentive. Cool thing is, it's like the, the Arab culture is just, they're just like the rest of us before we settle down as humans. They used to migrate and move. So, you know, take time, they would put up their big tents and they would like do whatever. And they would be on the camel, they would travel at night, or vice versa, they would travel as much in the daytime as they could, they would stop, you know, and everything was focused around water or getting to the next oasis or the next town or the next civilization, they would move. And if they chose to stay, they would stay. We as humans have done that forever. And it wasn't until what how many thousand years ago where we just decided, yeah, I'm not gonna migrate for, I'm just gonna hang out. Yeah, pretty sure yeah, they actually well, started in the Middle East, like in uh, Iraq. That's where I think they first Mesopotamia. had Mesopotamia. Yeah, Mesopotamia, so one of the first civilizations. Um, well, there's also Gobekli Tepe, which they recently discovered in Turkey, which actually rewrites when humans. It was thought that humans didn't really settle down to like five or six thousand years ago, but Gobekli Tepe was a permanent structure that goes back twelve thousand years. And it also goes to the theory that that Egypt is actually far old. The first civilization of Egypt is actually far older than people think, because they found uh, Robert Shock. This is all coming from Rogan's podcast, by the way. I'm a Rogan nerd, but Robert Shock, the geologist. I remember watching this before I heard about it from Rogan, but he said he went to ancient Egypt and he goes, "These are actually watermarks, which would put." ancient Egypt starting the Sphinx starting like 8,000 years ago. But yeah, we, yeah. for most of human history, we were just hunter gatherers wandering around. And that's in fact, why you shake a not shake, but why you rock a baby with, and it gets them to go to sleep. Cause it simulates the mother walking. It's crazy. And, it's crazy. It, and it's also, it's also, I think a lot of the, stress that uh human beings see today is due to like light pollution and you can't actually see the stars have you ever seen the pictures from the interior of uh, australia of the stars and it looks like something you've never seen before it's like the milky yeah. way is like yeah. 3d on top of you yeah i mean i think the biggest reason people are stressed is because they don't freaking work out I mean, humans are made to kind of like <laughs> move and do things, you know. And yeah, a lot of people no, are absolutely like, oh, crap. Do you know how much better I feel after sauna and doing yoga? Because I started doing. Chris, you'll laugh at this. I started doing. You remember the wrestler Diamond Dallas Page? 
<laughs> yeah, I started doing yeah. his yoga, dude. And it's a mixture of calisthenics and yoga. It's actually awesome. I feel so much better after I do yoga because you're breathing deep and then like sweating in the sauna. Huh. Well, wasn't it that there's a documentary on Netflix about uh, saving somebody or they saved uh, some wrestler? Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts. Yeah, right. he was an alcoholic addicted to crack too. And DDP yeah. was the one that got him doing yoga and shit. Yeah, brought him back, actually saved his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I have a dude I work with, man. He, um, I work with him in, uh, you know, you're not going to catch it because it's out of your system, but I'm pretty sure this, I'm pretty sure, I don't want to say that he does, but I'm pretty sure this dude smokes crack all the time because he's constantly hospitalizing himself. And he, it was the, the funniest thing. My boss laughed so hard at this comment. He goes, Hey man, you just bought a house, right? And I go, yeah. He go, how many bedrooms is it? I go, I go two. He goes, Hey, do you think I could rent your other room? I go, no. <laughs> just that quick and he goes he goes no he goes he goes he goes I'll pay you Come on, man. I, just, I just stay in my room i go sean i'm gonna be honest with you uh your weakness would piss me off on saturday you'd come out you'd be day drinking you would annoy me when i'm trying to do work and get stuff done and then i would use you as a jujitsu dummy yeah but here's the thing if you know, no, i was just looking up this room podcast a guarantee uh, yeah. on our podcast. He'd be sitting in the back smoking crack right now and like <laughs> looking like Hunter Biden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's stay away from that. <laughs> we get so many more and would add more excitement to it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. God damn it. All right. Nah, yeah, no worries. Hey, so you brought up it'll get it'll, get it'll get it'll get Dug up when you when you write your memoir, twenty years in the Air Force and power production. You honestly, yeah. honestly, should consider writing a book when you're done, man. When you retire, I just, probably should if I could remember everything that I've seen and done in the Air Force. Strongman wrote it. Strongman wrote a book already. It's not about the Air Force. <laughs> well, got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Air Force is the pinnacle of manhood, and that's what I'm trying to reach every day. I'm striving. If you're in the Army, that's what you say. If you're in the Navy, or if you're in the Marines, you say the Navy is the pinnacle. Or the Coast Guard, whatever. You know, oh, definitely the Coast Guard. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I have a joke in my act about, um, like, like you, do you know how, like, when people find out that you served, somebody that's never served is like, well, I almost served. Talk to a recruiter. And I just go, that's not almost serving. Almost serving is going to a recruiter and finding out that you have a medical disability that precludes you from service. And then I pause and I go, are you joining the Coast Guard? That's almost serving. <laughs> well, it's totally different. <laughs> yeah, I always hate that. No, I have nothing. Coasties, if Coastie watches this, I have nothing but respect for the Coasties. I saw this. And I'm actually opposed. I'm actually opposed to the drug war, but I saw this video where this Coast Guard guy jumped on a drug machine, a uh, drug submarine with a, with a with a with his M16, and I'm like, you know, I'm opposed to the drug war, but if you're going to give me a gun and tell me I can jump on a fucking drug submarine, bust the people, I'm going to do it. That just seems well, way too badass. Like the power boat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's pretty much. You give me a 50 cal. I might be morally opposed to what you tell me to do, but I might need to test that 50 cal out. <laughs> you know, I have to say, it has been several years since I've heard a 50 cal just go off for a long time. Apparently, there's a test range off of Herbert Field somewhere out that way, way out there. We we're doing an install in this guy's house, and they were setting off munitions and dropping bombs on this range. I'm like, whoa. That's really close. I'm having some, you know, like thoughts of being like back in Baghdad with mortars coming in. And the guy goes, yeah. yeah, they're getting a little close, but just wait till a little bit when the sun gets ready to start going down. I was like, really? Why? He goes, ah, you're in the military. You'll like this. So you hear a, you hear the plane come by and you hear the boom. And then you hear, 
do, 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 do. The 50 cal just goes off like two and a half minutes straight. I'm like, what the fuck are they shooting? Who's, <laughs> who's shooting a 50 cal for two and a half minutes straight? That's actually like not good on practice. <laughs> it wasn't just, it was several of them. They were just like one and then another one and another okay. one and then another one and another one. So it was like a, it's a test range where they, they have targets and you have one group. One group has to do one thing. The next group has to do a separate thing forced at the same target. That group has a different target a mission. So it's just different groups. And they were just like, okay, you go, stop, you go, stop, you go, stop. And that's just how it went. Oh, yeah, that, that makes more sense. Because if you shoot a 50 cal for two and a half minutes straight, you're just going to burn out the barrel, you know? Like the old 50 cal, you just like make it glow red and just blow up. They actually yeah, issued dude, mittens dude. For 50 cal. So you, you, you have these mittens so you don't burn your hand when you're changing the freaking barrel. That's how hot it yeah, is. Yeah, that comes from the M60. The M60 was the same way. You had a barrel, a guy that was the barrel changer. He would take those mittens and go. Yeah. Well, wasn't it, yeah. wasn't it John Bastalone? Didn't he win, didn't he win the medal of honor? Because I mean, he got like third degree burns because he actually picked up the fucking 50 cal that they were using or the machine. I don't know if it was a 50 cal, but the machine gun they were using during world war two, there's stories of during world war two guys were pissing on the barrel as they were firing. To cool yeah, it I mean, he, he probably didn't pick up a 50 because those are like insanely heavy, you know. Maybe it was some kind of lighter yeah, but, machine, yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure oh, I there's, remember there's like, all kinds, there's all kinds of stories of guys doing that back in the day. I mean, Vietnam, I think I heard a story about the guys in Vietnam doing the same thing, so well. It's the like civilians don't know the rule, the rule is the generation before you was always harder than you were, and that's why it's um. True. The dude that the Pacific was made was was based on his book. Uh, forget the guy's name, but it's called like with the old breed because this is okay. dude. This is a guy fighting in World War Two, so he grew up in the Great mm -hmm. Depression. So this dude is hard as a coffin nail, talking about how the guys from the generation before him are way harder than he is. Sure, yeah. No, I I told you what was going to say about the millennials. Huh? Like, it's what like the, you say about the millennials. <laughs> oh, they were so well, hard. I, the, the millennials, the millennials are getting oh, unfair. Uh, no, hold on, the millennials are getting unfair <laughs> angst because I'm, I'm I was born in '78 and I'm like just before the millennials. And I mean, you're talking about millennials starting 1984, and I know a lot of hard ass motherfuckers that were born in 1984, and you know, serve in the military. It's the millennials are getting the shit that's coming from Gen Z. That's where the real, all this, they're the first generation that was raised on participation trophies. I was like 20 when I heard that everybody got a trophy and I was like, yeah, but did you win anything? No. Yeah, okay. you know, I, 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 sports. I actually got, I actually got it every year. I, mean, I don't know if that was a participation trophy or not, but I remember getting a trophy no matter if we won or lost. So maybe I'm one of those people that got that. Yeah, but I mean, then you went and became a grunt. So I think you understand the value of hard work. That was never the only thing. But you know. Look, I, I've said some I've said some stuff that's pissed like my nieces off, where they're like telling me what they're learning in school, and I'm like, "What kind of soft ass shit are you talking to me about?" And they're like, "But I'm like, this is nonsense." And then my brother goes, "Who's that sound like? Sounds like me." <laughs> my brother's like, "You got to earn stuff." Like, well, what kind of stuff are being taught in school? America's bad. What what state did they go to school in? New York. Eh, yeah. Uh, no, no, wait. Comedy what comedy. part of New York? What part of New Western York? Western New York. Western New York. Like South Buffalo, Rochester. Western New York? Huh? Like Buffalo? South. Oh, you said Rochester, so. All south, right. of, south of Rochester. Like, my town is about 15 minutes outside. I grew up, I grew up next to a cornfield. So when I tell people, I'm like, I'm from New York. Like, I remember I was sitting there with Stamper one day, and he goes, 
dude, I can't believe you're from New York. You seem like you, you seem like a guy that's from the country. And I go, I grew up next to a farm that I used to go out and pick berries on and hunt deer on. I'm like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not like a city guy. I don't like the city. In fact, even in Clearwater where I am now, I don't like the fact that my neighbors are right next to me. No, that's why I live. That's why we came here because it's still country. Sort of. Bro, I, I, bro, I'm telling you right now, I would probably prefer where you are to where I am, but this is just where work is right now. And I, you know, no, I, um, like with my deg my degree field, if I would have done more research, I would have been where you are because I could get a, a job with my degree and not have to bust my ass, you know, digging in the dirt, digging ditches, putting yeah. in generators in people's houses. Yeah. So. Oh, dude, the, like out here, you'd be fucking just pouring a concrete slab and hooking that shit in. And like, there's like, there's a huge demand for people that can put in generators down here. Us all over the state. That's, that's um, one company I worked for. It's they're six plus behind. Yeah. The company because, I'm I mean, for now, they're getting them in faster and they're doing them much faster at a faster rate. My my goal is my goal is in the next five years is to get a generator installed in this house if I'm still here. Like if strongman and I make it big on YouTube, and then uh -huh. I can actually become a professional Not comedian. I'm, I yeah. how many square feet is your house? Not much. I want to talk to you. I want to talk you into this right now. I'm going to talk you into this right now. <laughs> how many square foot is but, your hold house? On. Wait, let me just let me just finish. I yeah. personally see myself in Texas at some point. Don't go to Texas, dude. Why? Texas okay. seems like where it's, I've always wanted to move to Texas. Look, Texas is a very conservative state, and that's great, but it is an ugly freaking state. Like, just uh, living in Texas, Texas is going to go purple, and purple going to turn blue. There's just nothing there. It's just like plain. As far as the eye can Hold see, if you want to have a low tech, no, 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 I drove, no. I drove through, oh, I drove through uh, El Paso. Fucking loved the way that was. I love the Southwest, man. After living in Arizona for five years, Texas I get is half it. and half. As you leave Louisiana, Texas is still green. As you get past Dallas, Texas turns tan, and there's no trees. Yeah, that was the Texas I was in. I was in Central Texas when I was in the Army. And, like, mm -hmm. it was just driving anywhere. It was just nonstop plane, and it was just like, oh, my God. It's not bad living. I mean, where do you think all the mesquite trees come from is Texas? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a bad place to live, but, like, I, I like having, like, more greenery, you know, stuff like that. Like, I don't, I don't have to live in California, but just, like, the plane That's why I like being here. I got the best of – in this area of Florida, I've got the best of both worlds. I've got all of the military bases here that I can shake a stick at. I've got all the trees. I've got, you know, lakes and rivers, and I've got the ocean. I just don't have mountains, and I hate to say it, but I kind of like living with the mountains when I was in Pennsylvania. But I don't have that anymore because – Pennsylvania was turning blue, and there's nothing to do. You, dude, in my area, this place is all blue. But, like, I live in a town that's, like, it's a tiny pocket of deep red. But everywhere else, it's blue. And I actually live You're in the other doing? What's up? You're in Virginia? Yeah. Where in Virginia? Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads. How close is that to Alexandria? Three hours. So we're in like, I'm in like okay. central eastern Virginia. I'm not in northern Virginia, but like right. where my area is, it's very blue all around. And then we have this tiny little mm -hmm. pocket where people live where it's red. So, like, so it's, huh? So you're close to the Highway 95 corridor then? No, I'm off, I'm off 64. So if you, if you go to Richmond, okay. you take 64. Right. Yeah. Yes. I know where you are. Okay. I know where you are. Yeah. I mean, it's just. It's so blue in some areas that there is no conservative candidate in the election. Like I was going to vote one time, and I was like, "There's one dude, and he's a Democrat. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? Screw this." So, well, I always put it out there, and I'm going to put it out there for the live stream. 
Like I am a social libertarian, fiscal conservative, Second Amendment supporter, and I'm always running for office wherever. I'm just not going to put any effort into it. If you want to vote for me wherever you are, I'll be more than happy to come there and be your politician. And here's how this will work. Every new law that somebody pushes, I'll say, you need to repeal two laws before I'll put this law in. <laughs> I'm not That's voting for any too many, laws. too many laws on the books. There's too many. I, I, I was arguing with Second Amendment people, and they're like, uh, anti-Second Amendment, and they go, I, this is what's frustrating about the, the Second Amendment guys. They won't budge. I'm like, there's 20,000 laws on the federal books. That's not counting the state laws. There's hundreds of thousands of laws that we as two A'ers have compromised on, and I'm not compromising anymore. No. Uh, and, and there's and my thing always goes back when we bring up two A is you can make all the loose the the laws and rules that you want to, but at the very end of the Second Amendment, it says, and these rights shall not be infringed. So you can't make laws against the Second Amendment. You just well, this, can't. This because is, this is the ignorance. This is the ignorance that you that you face. You, you have a famous politician going. You don't need an AR-15. They're harder to use. And when you correct them, actually, the AR-15 is one of the easiest platforms to use. A 70-year-old woman very can use easy to use. I was like, I was like, like what I remember. Who said uh, it was to use? Politicians. I mean, what was it? Uh, what was his name? Was, Texas? Was, was that Beto? Was that Beto or Rourke that actually said, no, it wasn't him. All right, because I know it was one of those. Hell yes. stupid he idiots. said, "Hell yes, we're, we're coming for our AR-15s." And I wish I was sitting across from him so I could go. Did you guys watch the the Chernobyl special on HBO? One of the best specials that's ever. It's one of the best five episode films that's ever been made. But in it, I use this analogy. In it, Chernobyl goes off. They need these miners to um, dig a tunnel under Chernobyl so that they could pump water through there to cool down the nuclear reactor. Anyways, the minister of coal shows up and he's flanked by two soldiers who look inexperienced and they just have their AK-47s. The head miner comes out and he goes, get on with it. You start shooting, we'll rush you. We'll take those guns and beat you to death with them. Anyways, the minister of coal, who you can tell is just a politician, pleads with them for the greater good of the Soviet Union. They need to do this. And they say, okay, you convinced us. And then they walk up to this guy in his little suit, his neat suit, who's never done a hard day's work in his life. And they slap him across the face and they slap coal on his, on his, on his blazer. So that he's just covered in coal. And then the final guy goes, now you look like the minister of coal. Beta O'Rourke is that. He's the spineless little. He's the spineless little guy that's never done a hard day's work in his life that became a career politician. And it's like, listen, dude, you will never get your hands on my AR-15 unless you send some officer of the federal government to take it from me. But you personally won't grab it from me. You know, yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> but it's like, but it's like I would ask. I would ask a guy like, okay, so Chris. Either one, well, either one. What chance does your wife have to fend you off without 100%. a fire? Hundred percent. I'm weak, dude. Yeah, <laughs> my, wife, right. my, my wife's from New Jersey. She'll beat the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, besides being nice, unless your wife's Gina Carano. I mean, more than likely, the average woman is at a huge disadvantage to the average man. They need a firearm to protect themselves. Dudes are creepy. I'm a dude, and I'm telling you, dudes are creepy. That's why it makes the style of handguns that they do. Look at the style of handgun that Sig makes where, all right, so here is all right, your standard, but you're normal. I'm a six-foot dude. I have a big large hand, so... Your average pistol 
but this is your average size of your pistol for a grip for your pistol it's right here right sig makes one that's what that big right yeah that's a, that's a woman's hand it's like three of my fingers or two and that's designed for a woman and they even have it up to a 44 or 45 caliber that's it's a lot well i love the 1911s that's me it's, Go up to it. Oh, I got a 44 Magnum. Eh, I'll take the 45. Less kick. Still put you down. One shot. But Slow, I mean, if this is just through the wall. You know, not every woman is Alex Zedra, who's out there, like, you know. <laughs> but uh, for the average woman who wants to carry a handgun, Sig makes a, a, a pistol that they can put in their purse, that they can put somewhere that's if they want to do concealed or if they want to open carry or whatever if they have a small compact handgun that has a lot of stopping power for i mean I, I've seen pistols that are like literally painted pink so i'm guessing those are the kind ah. of pistols that are marketed to women you know they are and some of them are 45 caliber pistols that hold five rounds and that's a lot for the, uh, for self-defense purposes, that's a lot. I mean, think about it. a yeah. nine mil at 20 feet is going to stop somebody, but a 45 at 20 feet is really going to stop somebody. We're talking about a hole this big going in about this big coming out. Oh, dude, a 45, if it hits you in the shoulder, you're done. You're on the ground. Um, your shoulder's gone, too. But, I mean. Um, exactly. And if your husband's like, smart, I was, he's behind you hollow points, and it's even worse. <laughs> well, dude, so. it's literally it was caught on camera in a house, a home invasion, and the wife is trading shots around the corner with these guys that broke in and are holding her husband hostage at gunpoint. He held him off for long enough that she could go get the gun. And I mean, so it's like. Well, I mean, the odds of that happening are zero. And it's like, well, the odds of anything happening might be really low, but I want the tool there. Like, I might never need a wrench, right. but I, I want to own a wrench. You know, yeah. it's, I, to, to give you the mindset of it, I had a friend who's really liberal, and we were arguing in the bar, and I said, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. And he said, assault rifle and he said was the ar and ar-15 stand for and i go armalite rifle design 15 and everybody just stopped i was like dude you are not mentally equipped to have this conversation with me and then he said well why would you even need seven more than seven rounds in a rifle and i go i don't know because if somebody was breaking into my house i would be terrified and i'm like and I have some level of training with firearms. I'm sure I'm going to miss because I'm scared. I don't know what this, who's breaking in. I don't know whether it's Brock Lesnar or a guy with a knife or whatever it is. I'm terrified. If somebody's willing to just come into my house, I am terrified of that person. So I'm going to miss. And yeah, people I, like think you're going to be like rational and calm if somebody breaks into your house. No, you just need to have one, one round. No. And you shoot him in the leg, and no, like like you said, you're going to be crap in your pants. You're probably going to be shooting wildly. You're going to want it's a lot of capacity. Very, very good point. And it's like this: we're going to back to the scale thing again. Okay, so when you're asleep, your heart rate is here. When you're in traffic with somebody, they pissed you off. Your heart rate is here, right? You're get like a little bit of adrenaline rush. When someone breaks into your house and you see they have a gun, your heart rate is now up here, and your your anxiety and your adrenaline are through the roof. You're you're going to well, not be rational here's, at here's, all. Here's here's the best way to put it. Here's the best way to put it. If you wanted to train for the possibility of somebody breaking into your house and where your heart rate rate is going to be at, go run three miles. Do 100 push ups, do 100 squats, then go to the range and shoot because that's where your heart rate is going to be at. It's going to be pegged. That's a good point. That's a very, very fair and very, very good point. They used to make us do that at the range. Really like, you know, put your kid on, go do a sprint or do a bunch of sprints. It's called a stress shoot. And then you'd sit down and you'd be like, oh, because you'd be, you'd be yeah, so. Yeah, that whole figure eight thing is like. <laughs> 
It's all over the place. Can't yeah, do it. it's, it's like it's like I don't. I just to, to me where we've gotten in politics is I sit back and I go, I don't understand why you guys are arguing against your own interests. You're never going to be woke enough to not get canceled because you're always going to have like a funny off the, it's not politically correct thought. You know, mm -hmm. somebody dies of COVID, you're going to make a smart ass comment at some point. Like, good. They don't have to worry about COVID anymore. It's going to come out at a certain point. And, oh, I and you know, I think our channel's getting shut down. <laughs> oh, it, you want to get the channel shut down? I'll get it shut down here. I was explaining to somebody why masks are ineffective, and they go, "Oh, really? What do you know?" I go, "Think about how dumb your average person is." It's the Carlin joke. Then think half of those people are even dumber than that. And I go, "Do you think that the guy that's been carrying where is it? I probably got one in my pocket. Yeah, I do." I just throw this thing on just so I don't have to argue with people. I, that's because that's my like, main thing. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, do you think this is? Do you think this mask is effective? Because I work in a hospital, and the nurse explained to me this is actually really only to keep fluids out of your mouth, and it's really not effective after about 15, 20 minutes. People have been using M95 masks for a year, like. I, I was in the sauna explaining to a guy wearing one of these. He's in the sauna with it on. And I go, <laughs> you know, the second you sweat into that, that mask is no longer effective. And he goes, really? I didn't know that. This guy is wearing masks. In the sauna. So, you want to have this popping in his eyes? <laughs> He's so stupid, man. You want to you bring this up? You, you talk to my wife about it. Because she oh, was shut this entire look, she's been in the medical field as long as I've been in power generation. And mm -hmm. she is an occupational therapist. If you want to bring the mouse topic up, you talk to her about it. She will I'm telling you right now, she will shut the entire mass population down. Because there's what, like on the, on the effect she is on, on the effect and like am I wrong in what I'm saying or no, no, exactly, exactly what you're saying. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, you know, exactly obviously. what you're saying. Yes, because yeah. her and I have all we we've, we've researched it, we've read all the studies, and there's the sweet the the study that just recently came out. Her and I have both read it. If you are in you know, okay, you work in a medical environment, right? The same as her. Mm -hmm. If if you wear an N95 mask, you're also wearing the gloves. You're wearing the gown. And you're doing all this other stuff to be in preparation. But what do you also do after you've come out of that environment? You strip it all down. You throw it away. You put on new stuff. Yeah. What's the average person doing? They're going, oh, I got to wear an N95 mask. They get, in, they get a packet of N95 mask and they spray Lysol on it. Yep. Every day they spray Lysol on it and they air dry it. They put it back on. They spray Lysol and they air dry it. You're not doing anything. It doesn't work. There's a there's from the if you three. Spray, if you spray Lysol on an M95 mask, you just ruined that M95 mask. Yes, the only way to clean an N95 mask is through ultraviolet light, and it has to be a yep. specific ultraviolet light machine to do that with. And you can only do it so many times. It just you can't keep we do using stupid things. It's Dude, like this. This was. This is a piece of. This is a piece of a T-shirt. I mean, look at this. This is supposed to what, stop me from spreading some fucking disease that's causing people to die. We're not bleeding out of our eyeballs and our ears. We're not turning into zombies. I'm sorry. It's just. Dude, it doesn't work. Dude. Dude, we've been canceled because of our our. But no, dude. Like this conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just got this I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. This conversation occurred. This conversation occurred uh Friday. Boss calls me. He's okay. like, hey man, I gotta ask you, you gotta go, you gotta go into a tuberculosis room. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. Shit in my pants. Three weeks ago, <laughs> my boss just goes, Hey, can I ask you, uh, would you because just doing your doing what you're told at my job is an exceptional mm -hmm. employee. But 
can I ask you to go to the COVID ward? Like, yeah, man, I'll go. Guy's shocked because everybody's freaking out. And he's looking at me weird and I go, I don't give a fuck about COVID. I'm not scared of it in the least. I'm like, I'm like the odds of me dying from it are 0.01%. Tuberculosis going into that room terrified me. COVID, I just throw on a mask, gown up, walk in there, do what I have to do and walk out. I don't care. I'm like, I'm not even worried about it. And I go, here, with all your security precautions right now, I'm going to tell you why this whole thing that you're doing is just the illusion of safety. You walk in with shoes, you haven't cleaned said shoes, you walk out, you just tracked out COVID. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the illusion of safety. It's, and it's like right. when, you go to the, when you go to the store, you go to the store, there's people wearing gloves. Now, if I pulled them aside, I'd be like, what are you accomplishing? Oh, like, well, I'm avoiding COVID. Well, when you, take, when you take that home, okay, let's say that COVID is now on your gloves. Everything that you've touched is now contaminated. Are you going to wear those gloves when you get home? Well, well, no. Okay, but anywhere you set that stuff is now contaminated. Mm -hmm. This is how this works. Yeah. yeah, but like what yeah. the media that does is they'll show like one example of somebody that's young, you know, one of the few young people that died. And they'll say, well, this could happen to you when it's so statistically unlikely that it's basically not going to happen. But that's how they that's how they use the propaganda and the manipulation to really kind of like make people I do pass, the thing to do. I pass a guy every day on a bicycle wearing a mask. Yeah, dude, that is the dumbest. I mean, if you're inside, okay. But if you're outside, like, come on, man. Like, I'll be walking in their car like, over their faces. They pass me. I'm like, we're outside. And you're like six feet from me. You're not going to get COVID from me. But, what about in a car with your significant other? The person you're in your house with every day of your life. And you get into a car and you're both wearing a mask. Now, the only time that, like, sometimes that happens, but that's because, like, I leave a store and I, like, have it on, you know, and then I take it off when I'm, when I'm driving. So maybe that's yeah. what... As soon as I come out, off. I mean, it's not, I'm not wearing it because of any, like, safety thing. I just take it off. Or I forget to take it off because I'm, like, used to wearing it. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I'm wearing my mask. And then I'll take it off. I, I don't wear one ever unless it's... Uh, you know, I walk into a store like Best Buy. Best Buy says, hey, put on a mask. Okay, cool. Walk into Target. Put on a mask. Okay, sure. It's your rule. Whatever. Just play but the game. I walk in here, it's exactly play the game. Hmm? Hey, wait, Chris. Did you have Wegmans in Western PA? Yeah, dude. Wegmans is great, but I like Giant a little bit better. Okay. You got Publix now. Have you been to Publix? I go to Publix every day. Pretty comparable to Wegmans, but I was in I was in Publix getting a pub sub, and uh, this guy's behind me and I'm paying in line. I got my mat. I got my mask on. He doesn't have a mask on. He's looking at me nervously. There's a crowd of people. Just go. Eh, I'm gonna shut that down, dude. I don't care if you wear a mask or not. <laughs> I said it in front of everybody. Yeah. I'm like, I just wear this mask so I don't have to argue with people. I know that it's not effective. He goes, oh, thanks, man. And then the woman behind him looks at me and goes, hey, I really appreciate you being like that. I was like, eh, whatever. <laughs> Took my pub sub and left. How about was this? Like, hey. When I was in New Jersey, I didn't have a mask and I wanted to go get fried. I wanted to go get something to eat. And I ride around like, oh, look, there's a Popeyes. I want to go get something to eat. And I'm like, fuck, I don't have a mask. And this is like when the pandemic is like, really high and going on and I, I'm just able to go back and do my drill weekend finally. It's been like two, three months and I get like, shit, I have a mask. Fuck, I'm just going to go in and go, in and go do my thing. I go in, everybody's got a mask and everybody's like, oh, look at that guy. Look at that guy. And I'm like, fuck you people. I'm just going to go in and order my thing. I order my thing and this guy comes up to me and goes, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, for what? He goes, for not wearing a mask because you're so brave and I just don't have it in me to do what you're doing. <laughs> like, 
I just <laughs> forgot it in my hotel room. It was like 10 miles that way, and I'm not turning around to go back. You are a modern day superhero, <laughs> dude, dude. You did some. You did some. Ro- you did some Rosa Par- Parks esque shit right there. Dude, I, you're gonna be in the history books. Yeah, I I can't can't go yeah, but I for standing up for what I believe. In. But it, dude, um, dude, it's it, it was. I was literally arguing with a dude on Facebook back in March when I said. F this unconstitutional BS. Live your life. You're gonna die anyways. How is this unconstitutional? Yeah. Um, I'll just start at freedom of movement and just keep working down from there if you want me to. Mm-hmm. This guy sure. just kept telling me I'm an idiot and I don't understand science. He goes, science is in. Mass work. They prevent COVID and we need to lock down. I go, the science no, no. isn't in on the 1920 Spanish flu, you dolt. I'm like, no. science is never done. I'm like, science, the, all science says is, here's the theory of gravity. This is the best explanation we currently have on how gravity works. So no, in the past two weeks, the science on COVID isn't in. And also, I'm going to tell you something else. COVID was here long before they think it was. It was back here in September. Actually, people, I can go back even further than that. You probably can. It I, I, I wouldn't surprise me. How about March 2019 in Spain in a dry, a dry bed of waste water? So human fecal matter that goes. So you have two types. You have several different types of waste water. You go into a uh, sewage plant, right? So you have dry beds like they have in Europe. And you have liquids and like whatever else stuff like they do. So they went as core samples of wastewater, dry waste beds, so they could get like whatever. And they found one from back in 2019, which was the furthest back they went in Spain, which was one of the highest peaks in the summer. Yeah, they found COVID-19 in a poop sample from 2019 in March. Yeah, it's not Ta-da. surprising to you. Still well, alive. People, it was alive. People call me a conspiracy theorist because they said, um, they're like, well, do you think that it was cooked up in a lab? I go, no, but I think it was experimented on in Wuhan and it just got out because that facility has been cited numerous times for lack of security protocols. And then yeah, you're a conspiracy theorist. It's insane to think that it might have leaked. Like, that's not a weird, crazy conspiracy. It's possible. It's very possible. You know, it's not something you well, should discount automatically. Dude, um, there was a there was a biologist on Rogan's who said, you know, look, with CRISPR Cas9 and the current technology, like I, I talked about this in a podcast I did by myself. I go, you want the nightmare scenario? You're worried about guns, 3D printed guns, which are already here. But here's a nightmare scenario: in 20, 25 years, there's going to be a kid in his basement that can cook up weaponized smallpox on a little machine because of CRISPR Cas9. And to say that to say that it's outside of the realm of possibility that a country with laxed ethical standards like China would be experimenting with something like CRISPR Cas9 and weaponizing a virus is not outside the realm of possibility. And even if they did it actually helped them out in the global stage because I mean they're basically fully recovered now and everybody else is still sucking, you know. Yeah, but they're still locking people down because they're still having COVID problems. They're just not reporting it. Yeah, but like their economy is like like I looked at like some economic growth charts and like China's yeah. economy has grown like seven percent this year and everybody else has been basically flat. The worst thing that we ever did was send our manufacturing over there. Well, Hopefully that self corrects sometime in the future, but that those things take a long time to reverse themselves. But I mean, like as their middle class gets wealthier, you know, it's going to be harder for and harder for them to, you know, have low prices for the stuff they manufacture because they have to pay these workers more money. So eventually, it'll oh, be yeah. some, some kind of self correction mechanism. But who knows how long? Well, dude. That, okay, so why I wanted to have my friend Ali on who's also unreliable is because he's a fan of Medicare for all. And he's also a fan of the 
$15 an hour minimum wage. And I wanted another guy on here who could explain to him how that works and how that hurts small business and, you know, benefits large corporations because they can afford to pay it. But, you know, it, 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 but, it, but, it, but it goes to it goes to what you said. As China's middle class emerges, it gets harder and harder to do it because those people demand more and more money. I mean, if you know what an income statement is and you know how, how companies do their balance sheet, it's pretty common sense that if you wage raises, it's going to make, you know, the cost of goods that you produce more expensive. And that's going to have an effect on the company's profitability which directly affects how many people you can hire and it affects everything, you know, but it's common sense. Wages are part of a business. It's as simple as that. But most, but most people don't know that. And people most don't realize people don't. Most businesses aren't that profitable. I mean, like they might, they might have like, you know, 6% profit margin. That's not a lot. And if you change a variable, you make, you know, either the materials you sell or your overhead or your labor, which is, Minimum wage. Fixed cost. You increase that, yeah. you could actually be unprofitable and go out of business. Well, you know, I was trying to explain this, and people got mad at me. And I go, okay, let's say there's no minimum wage, right? Let's say I'm a plumber, and I look at, I can take on ten kids, and I say to them, like, listen, I'll pay you a penny an hour. You're 15 years old. You live at home with your mom and dad. What you're really earning with me is a skill. So I can bring in all those people, expand my business. Then as a kid develops more and more skills, he's like adding to his resume. He's like, yeah, but I know how to do this, this, and this. It's like, okay. And he's like, the guy across the street, he's offering me two cents. But I really like working for you. So if you pay me 1.5 cents an hour, I'll stay with you. You're developing your skills, but... It, like with the, the signing of the minimum wage, I, I just don't think people understand this, that when you raise the minimum wage, you price out unskilled labor who then can't get the skills that they need to enter the marketplace. Exactly. And I mean, like you're, some people's labor is not worth $15 an hour. It's just not. If you don't have any skills, you don't get freaking paid. And on top of that, you know, the, the $15 wage, there's actually more cost to the business because they have to pay the social security contribution. That's an additional 6%. Then the, you know, state unemployment, what other, whatever, whatever the uh, like benefits they have. There's so many more additional costs that come from a higher wage that it's not just going to cost that business $15 an hour. It might cost the business 20 $25 an hour to pay that employee. And if you're not worth $25 no. an hour, you're not getting freaking hired. So let me ask you both of you guys a question. Okay, so we're talking about the $15 minimum an hour wage. Have either of you worked for a year at $10 an hour with no overtime? For a year? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, I $10 worked an hour for, for a year. Well, I worked. No, I worked. I mean, I worked less. I worked for less than that before I joined the Air Force. When I was working minimum wage jobs before I joined the Air Force, right. I worked at McDonald's yeah. and I was making. I worked forty hours a week, but I lived mm -hmm. with my parents. And they right. actually, when I was working at McDonald's, this guy came to me and he goes, "Hey man, would you be interested in the management path?" And then I, I had to tell him, "I go, listen, man, I enlisted in the Air Force." And he goes, "Okay, mm -hmm. all right." You know, what he understood, but like I was on the management path in McDonald's. I don't see anything wrong with people look down on McDonald's. McDonald's store manager makes 70 grand a year. Right. Okay. But so what I'm wrong with this is taxes. It's taxes. Okay. So yeah. if you make $10, if you make $10 or less an hour and you work a 40 hour week, and you don't work overtime. You make under twenty. You make twenty five thousand dollars or less. Yeah, thereabouts. Okay, so for every state in the union, including federal taxes, if you make less than twenty five thousand dollars, what happens? You get all of that money back. All of these kids are going to start working for fifteen dollars an hour, and they're going to start making more than twenty five dollars, twenty five thousand dollars a year, and they're going to go. Well, wait a minute. I've got to pay taxes. Yeah, 
you're a big boy now, you're a big girl, you got to pay taxes. <laughs> this is yeah. what real people do that make money and have earnings and they have degrees and they have backgrounds and they have trades. They've been doing this for a long time. This I was is actually what talking to the real world. Yeah, I was talking to this kid like a couple of years ago and he's like, hey, did you get a tax refund? I'm like, no, I didn't get a tax refund. He's like, I thought everybody got tax refunds. I'm like, no, I actually no. paid taxes. My, you took my money, and now it's yours. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. And it was like, oh my god, really? Oh. Yeah, that's the way this works. Well, that's the way it really this works. Is, so. This is what I was. This is what I've explained to people. I go, you know, the top marginal tax rate is. I, I think last time, what did Trump lower it to? Like thirty seven. Yeah, thirty seven. You know that what you're doing when you're paying those taxes is effectively working for the federal government for free. So 37% of your working life, you work <laughs> for free. And then I go, do you know what, it, it, when you talk about feudalism, do you know what a peasant paid in medieval times? It's about 25% of their labor. <laughs> you're paying more in your labor now and you used to judge those medieval peasants, but they had it pretty good. Yeah, they did it well, kind of, because they still had to go to the landlord as the landlord if they could go get married. So, I mean, God forbid mom and dad said, yeah, but the landlord says, eh, mm, mm, no, <laughs> not going to happen. I mean, my, my theory about taxes, like, because people have their taxes withheld on, in their paychecks, so they just get they just get the paycheck and they think that's what they make. And I, I don't think they really understand how much tax is being withheld. But if you're a 1099 worker, you get paid the full amount and you have to actually withhold your own taxes and pay them to the government quarterly. And once you start yeah. doing that, then you realize how much tax you're paying. It really hits home. Cause like, like I tutor people and I make like 40, 50 bucks, right? I have to put up, I have to put aside like 20 bucks right, right off the bat just to send to the government. It's like, cool. I, like I, I got this nice check and then, Oh wait, how ha almost half of it's freaking gone. I have to send it away. And like, then you realize yeah what you're actually doing, what, how much tax you're actually paying. That's why, that's how I get a tax refund back at the end of the year. And I know it's wrong and I shouldn't do it because I'm basically giving uh, the government my uh, money uh, if I claim zero. So uh, I claim zero. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like yeah, getting, a, wrong like, wrong getting a tax refund is like a huge no-no, but I mean, it, it is kind of like a good way to save a little bit well, of money. Ever, Chris, do you, under, do, you, do you understand what happened there? If the government holds your money for a year, you lost out on the the money that would have been paid to you had you invested it. Yep, I do. It's I mean, been like, broken before, though. So. We've it's, we've talked. Go ahead. It, that's true, but I mean, I go back and forth on the issue. But let's say I get a tax refund of a thousand dollars. I mean, I probably would have maybe spent that possibly. Had that not been withheld, you know, even so though I'm a what we do, No, what we do is we don't spend it. We actually pitch and hold all of it. All right. Um, I take whatever I get for child tax credit for each child and that gets split and it goes to individual accounts for the kids. And it just, we just, every year that, that happens, it just, we said it when we got married that if we get child tax credit, that's what we're going to do. And every year since then, this is exactly what we've done. Can I suggest something to you that's even better? Sure. Start them. Start a Roth IRA for them and put that tax money in a, a total stock market or something like that. Total world okay, market. Okay, so we're just, that's what it, we're not it. very we're not very intelligent on. And we did start a Roth IRA, and we do take some money from our taxes, and we do put some money into our Roth IRA. No, well, but every year. Your, it's have to earn for, money. Like they have to actually have earned income to contribute to an IRA. So you, you can't just like fund a kid's IRA, but if they have a job. What, what, what can you, there's something that you can do. There's some form of yeah, tax it's advantage. Yeah, it's 529 for college. It's like a college thing. And then you can do like a UGMA or a UGMA. But like, that's like. No, no. So my oldest, there's nothing wrong with him. And he's already said he's going to military. And I said, good, because. You can go use a GI Bill just like I did and your mom did, and you can put your ass through college. But my youngest, yeah, well, that's uh, when I have but to, Chris, 
if you want, dude, hey, here, here, I'm just going to break it down for you. Mm -hmm. We'll make you a better investor than 95% of all the people on the planet. Go to the Boglehead forums on Reddit, read, take the money that you're going to put, put it in a total stock market, VTI or VT, which is the total world market. 95% of all money managers can't beat a simple index fund. You're now a better investor than 95% of the people on the planet. Now, what can I do? How can I take that and use that with my 401k to make it so that when I'm 65, I you can have, just take back you have, Air Force you have, and go, you have, hey. <laughs> Yeah, you have the thrift savings program, right? So you have a 5% matching there. Okay, you want the Roth. So a Roth is taxed up front, goes into the goes into your Roth. Think of your Roth as a cookie jar and your investment as the cookie that you put in there. The Roth is taxed up front. So when it goes in there, it grows tax free. 59 and a half, you can withdraw that money. You don't owe Uncle Sam anything. A traditional okay. goes in tax free when you take it out and you have to take it out by 72. Uncle Sam gets his cut. But this is just the simple facts about it. it, it low cost index funds, very few investors have actually beaten them and they're all legendary. Warren Buffett, hmm. you know, uh, Peter Strong Lynch. Man. Who? Strong man. <laughs> Strong man. Joke. Noggy. <laughs> Actually, the lifetime return on my portfolio is 12.5% over 10 years, the past 10 years. And it's all in index funds, Danny. <laughs> like, hey, the, the Vanguard Total Healthcare. Index fund since 1984 has re returned 15%. Even most of the best investors that work at hedge funds can't beat that. And what did I do? I didn't have to run any numbers and I went to the beach and I just drank some beer. But everything that you need to know is in the Boglehead forums on Reddit. And then, hmm. but, but I mean, literally, you're probably not going to do better than if you just a simple. S and P 500 index fund, total stock market, total world market. It's probably the best, but that's all you need to do. Well, I mean, that's what I want to do. I mean, because I started my 401k back in 2011. I'm not kidding you. Uh, this is not Air Force related. This is not thrift savings. This is not TSP. This is nothing. This was just, hey, we're oil and gas, and we'll all 401k. Okay, okay, so. Traditional, traditional, or Roth? It was a traditional 401k. Okay. And it was heavily based in energy. And I made a lot of cash in two years of my investment. And I carried that over when I went to another company and I just left it where it was. And I made a little bit more because energy kind of came down. So it's still invested in energy. And I think some of it is in commodities. And it's just kind of like stagnant. I haven't really gained. I haven't really lost because I haven't put any money into it. Now that a company I'm finally working for finally does 401k because I'm out of school. I've graduated. I'm out of all my stuff and I'm working for a company that actually does do shit. So as soon as I'm able to invest with my 401k, I want to take whatever I've got and I'm going to roll it over what they have. And I want to do it in a matter that I can start making money again. Cause right now my 401k is worth about half of my yearly salary. And I'd like to get it up so that when I finally do want to retire, and I'm 65, nine seventy whatever it's going to be before i'm dead i'd like to live comfortably and not have to work and go see my grandkids and all that are kind of cool stuff i mean if you said jay like when you when you when you're able to see the new mutual funds that are available and your new 401k mm -hmm. you can just send us all the funds that we can look at and probably pretty quickly figure out where you should best put your money simple ah, as cool that. deal we, we have to deal. we have to see what's in it because like they can have a bunch of yeah, crap like it they do i wouldn't I wouldn't recommend somebody's money being any one spe uh, industry specific index fund. Mm -hmm. If it's I've heard Vanguard, Vanguard 
total world market, you own the entire world mm -hmm. market. If it's, the, if it's VTI, you own the entire United States market. If it's the S&P, P500, you own the S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in the United States. Um, okay. So, yeah, I would have to look at what they're, what they're offering you. I would have to look at that okay. because even like I do this at work with people and I, I go, where's all your money in the TSP? And they go, oh, I got my money in the G fund. I go, okay, you worked 40 years, put a hundred dollars a week, a oh, hundred dollars a month away you lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not a million dollars. That's how that works. Mm -hmm. And plus the G fund is just government treasuries and they might, those might be inflated away to nothing. So you might actually- Oh, they're going to be inflated away to nothing. It's like, dude, would you loan the US, US government money? Like, no. <laughs> like, no, because I know maybe. how the US government works. So no, I'm not giving you my money. <laughs> They are very well, good at dollar, okay? They know they know how to take money and build massive wealth very efficiently. They just know. But efficiently but, unefficiently. How about yeah. that? Here's, that sounds better. <laughs> here's 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 the simple facts of the whole thing. Um Warren Buffett, I forget the name of the hedge fund he bet. But he bet the guy a million dollars that his hedge fund couldn't outperform the Vanguard uh, S and P five hundred fund over ten years. The manager of the hedge fund capitulated after seven years that he couldn't beat it. This is a guy sitting around with people on payroll that are advanced mathematicians and an army of computers, and they still just couldn't beat a simple index fund. So the point is, why would you even try? Right, because I'm smarter than them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically is smarter than a computer at chess. So Look, I read a Robin Hood article. I know what I'm doing by art. <laughs> by art. Well, then, I'm doing. I, I wanted to do what you did. I'm still going to do it. But uh, arcs up 154 percent. Take your profits. Take your profits really? now. Anytime. Like, Chris, your ideal gain, and this actually comes from Warren Buffett, is eight to ten percent okay. per year. Because the reason right. being, when stuff like my U.S. growth fund shoots up 50% in a year, I'm now seeing diminished returns on future returns because I'm overpaying for it. Yeah, in an ideal world, if you were going to have, so you want a million dollar portfolio, it 3% dividend, it pays you an extra $30,000 a year. In an ideal world, that thing would stay flat until the day before you retired and it would shoot up 10,000%. It's not going to do that, but so. That'd be fantastic. Like, and, and there's, yeah. And there's another thing you always have to be aware of is don't chase returns. That's what people okay. do. They're like, Oh, this, this, this ETF or this stock is running up. That's where I need to put my money. Where you want to put your money is like in March when the oil companies the oil price was bottoming out, that's when you buy. Oh, you don't want right. that. Because what's going to happen in the EV market is when the EV market sell-off comes, I'll buy a little bit of the EV market and people will tell me I'm a dumbass. And I'm like, mm. all right. Oh, one day I will buy Tesla stock when it's at like 70. <laughs> I will definitely get in right at that point. I, I made the joke, I'm going to buy one share of Tesla when it drops to 50 just to laugh just to look at my portfolio and laugh about it no then we can say now's actually a good time to buy tesla then we can actually tell people the truth but yeah but investing is not hard um you just like unless you have so this is what i say to people unless you have an actual interest in this and you know how to use the fundamentals, you don't really have business buying an individual stock. And, you know, the average person, like, I'll tell you this, this was in my, I was in my break room taking a break and this woman's like, you're really into investing, right? And I go, yeah. 
She goes, Tesla is the stock I want to buy, right? And I go, no. Did you max out your TSP this year? And she goes, no. I go, then why would you buy an individual stock? She goes, well, because everybody's telling me I should. I go, yeah, but based upon what metric? And she's looked at me stunned. And I go, see, this is the problem. You can't even give me a real reason why you're buying the thing that you're buying. Mm -hmm. I can give you a real reason to buy a car. I can give you a real reason to buy the TV that I just bought. I cannot give you a real reason to buy a $17,000 stock. I, I yeah. personally, I can't do it. But that's the point. Why even try? Like your brain is geared towards generators and stuff. Just throw your money in index funds, man. You're not going to beat it. I'm not going to beat my my little portfolio that I do with five percent of my money. It's not going to be indexed. I just do it for fun. Right. I just want to be able to have. I just like I said. I want to be able to when I start my 401k back up and I start investing back into it again. I want to be able to put money into it to get a return back and have the company match. This we're on like a six percent match, and dude, you got a six percent like, match. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's serious. The company does six percent match. That's good. Mm -hmm. It is. So that's what I'm gonna. I'm gonna like get them to match me at six percent. I'm going to invest heavy and just run with it. Dude, yeah, I mean, if you see the funds that are in there, we can look at it. And then, you know, once you start investing in it, like, mm -hmm. basically, like, the market's not going to go up 10% every year. It's going to go up 30% one year, down 50%, up 60 sure. So you're not going to get 10% a year. But over the long run, it, the economy should grow or your stock portfolio mm -hmm. should grow by roughly 10%. So yeah. once you get all set up, that's all you really have to do is put it on autopilot and not worry about what's happening day to day. And that's, that's kind of what I want to do. I want it to be hands off because it's, I'm not good with watching numbers. I don't do no, numbers. You, you, you should set up your contribution and just never look at it again until you freaking retire. Don't look at it. Look at it one. Look at it once a year. That's right. it. And then understand, then understand this. The stock, your, your portfolio dips because of emergency. That's good. Now I'm buying up stuff on the cheap it'll shoot back up it don't be okay. like well this hasn't gone anywhere for a year you're gonna have years like that that's what a lot of these bro finance guys on youtube don't understand you're gonna have dead years where nothing yeah. happens yeah. and honestly at the price valuations that we're looking at now i think we're in for a flat decade where you're getting very small gains i'm excited uh, yeah, because what I understood was everybody kept saying, like, oh, well, under Trump, the stock market is the best it's ever been. And then a friend of mine sent me a link and said, mm, actually, under this year, under Obama, it was actually way higher than it is now. So what they don't, it what they matter don't, who's president. It, what, what, no, it goes, what, what matters just said, what's like this. What matters is the Fed. So the so the the best stock market of all time was under Bill Clinton, but that was financial engineering because Alan Greenspan artificially lowered the rates. So again, okay. the, the corporate world world got drunk on cheap money, and you had the tech boom. Tech boom happens. Interest rates have to rise now. We're in an untenable situation right now where they actually can't raise rates, or else the United States government with 130% of GDP is going to default on their loans. But under Barack Obama, it, it, after the financial crisis, they engaged in financial engineering again, which is quantitative easing. It's monetize, monetizing corporate debt. So the Fed is buying up this corporate debt. It's loaning itself money and buying up its treasury bills. It's an entirely fake and engineered thing. Trump taking credit, he never should have taken credit for the economy. Yeah, because I mean, um, it's money printing money. That's all it is. They just literally create money out of thin air, and that goes into yeah, stock. Yeah, bottom what that was. Yeah, and that's why that's why the stock price goes up. So all this money's flooding into the market. So like, are the returns real? 
Maybe not. Maybe it's just all inflation based. Right. And you have to, but you also have to understand this. It's something like 80% of all the returns that have ever come from the stock market actually come from dividends and inflation. When you look at like a, the historical return of the stock market, if you peg it at 7%, you got to look at a 2% dividend yield, a 2% inflation rate, right there you go. There's a large percentage of it. Gotcha. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to call it quits. I'm freaking tired. I'm call I was going to say I'm calling it quits too. Cause uh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like six and a half beers deep. I might call somebody a cunt that I shouldn't call a cunt. <laughs> get, get canceled. But Chris, um, when you get everything set up, we'll do another podcast and then you can just lead, sure. lead us the link and then we'll explain where you should put your money and um, we can explain like why. Sure. That would be cool. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure it'll all come in a PDF so I can send it to you and y'all can share it. And uh, yeah, we just kind of go from there with it. Look at it in real time. And we only pay $100 an hour. Oh, perfect. I'll send you one in Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, yeah. dude. We work for, yo, do we work for, we strip for Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I, I go out stripping on the weekends and I only accept Bitcoin. You have your little phone and they're like, they're like scanning your phone yeah. as you're dancing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> make it rain on me, guys. <laughs> there it goes. Go get it. <laughs> rain Bitcoins on me. Well, I have, I have this joke. I have this joke that it goes over well pretty well. I go, I, go, I bought a house, so I'm like out of the. I'm I'm not. I'm out of the zeitgeist. Is everybody still perpetually offended? Cancel creatures, still whacking it on parlor for their OnlyFans cash coin. Oh, for God's sakes! Yeah, yeah. Because it's pretty much summing up. Like I don't, Come from a different time, man. That's, that's exactly what it is. I'm sorry. That's exactly what it is. It's like, oh, no, people it's exactly that agree with it It's exactly what it is to the point where they're like, hey, did you watch? Like, nah, man, I, uh, I, the Outlaw Josie Wales came on, and then I just tuned out all your bullshit and watched the Outlaw Josie Wales because I love Westerns. <laughs> right? I, I don't understand where we got to the point where – we're not allowed to have opposing viewpoints from other people. I don't, I don't understand where that we, we weren't allowed to do that anymore. It's communist. The only, yeah. The only people that don't like uh, opposing ideas are people that don't have real ideas. Cause if your idea has no substance, you don't want argument to it. Well, that's true too. So it's like, I, I haven't listened to NPR in a very long time, but I was listening to NPR now because my band, I don't have Bluetooth and I can't like put my phone to the truck. Anyway, so listen to NPR and having studied emergency management for the last two years, they had the governor of Virginia on and they said, Hey, so now that the, you know, the new regime has come in, do you think that you're going to get your funding for your disaster declaration? Well, the disaster declaration is from the riots that have happened in the state, which is not something that you can get a grant for and declare a natural disaster or anything like that. You, you just, FEMA is not going to give you money because you didn't, do anything to stop this. You allowed this to happen. If this was something they were mostly that was peaceful. right, mostly peaceful protests. Okay, so <laughs> but regardless of point, he's like, oh yeah, and he said, I, I shouldn't say this about this administration, but this is what was on air. He said, yes, I feel confident now that the new administration has taken over that they will give me my funding. That's not the way this works. Just because someone that agrees with you or someone that aligns with your ideals doesn't mean that you get the things that you want. That's not how this works. Because there's, loop, there, there's, yes, sure, there's loopholes and everything, but that's not how this works. Dude. You can't just do that. 
dude, people wouldn't like me as like a governor. Like it doesn't matter whether it's the Capitol riots that happened mm -hmm. with, after that BS in Washington or whether you're trying to burn down a police station in Minneapolis. This is just going to be me. Uh, Capitol Police, you're authorized to use lethal force to repel the invaders. Rioting's yeah. not yeah. allowed. This is my mm -hmm. opinion on it. It's like, well, but you're so second amendment. When is violence allowed against the government? When they come to put you on the trains. That's the exact moment. When they come to put you on the trains, to put you in the re-education camp like they're doing for, to the Uyghurs, that's when you shoot back. Other than that, yeah. with reasoned ideas that you defeat BS, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, but we both know that there was no call to violence. In the no, I'm sorry, but when you, there's a video <laughs> that is of cancel, like cancel. opening up the gates and people just walking in. That's not the same as down in Guatemala or wherever it is where they're actively pushing back and like the mob literally pushes past them and they, that's not the same. A cap, there, was a, there was a Capitol police officer that was criticized for not arresting five people in there. And I'm like, clearly you just don't understand how cops work. Once the cop arrests somebody, he's now in charge of that person. He can't leave them. Now you've left those four people right. alone. Inside the camp. Like you, you wait for backup. Like, you know, it's, I don't, I don't like to see what like happened. My personal opinion is beat them down with truncheons, you know, and the guy with the Buffalo helmet on, you're learning it. Shit ain't a game when you go into the Capitol building. Nobody's playing with you at that point. You're going to jail for 20 years. Get used to it. Mm -hmm. You're not getting your special organic meals. Nope. That happened. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Like all right, guys, I'm going to bed. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm All good. Right. I'm, I'm going to tap out too before I say something <laughs> fucking way too stupid that gets me canceled. All right. Hey, thanks for coming on, Chris. Nice to meet you. Hey, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I love you, brother. It was awesome to talk to you again. And just let us know when um, you get your, your 401k. We'll set you up with a portfolio that if it fails, our portfolios will fail. I'll show you exactly, dude, I'll show you exactly where my money is. Like, how no, I have fine. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, let me get my 401k thing in, all that information, and then we'll I'll cook back up with you. We'll go from there. All right, brother. All right, later, guys. Oh, all right. Hey, see y'all. Later. Hey.